Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness has appointed the office of rulers and parliament, parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of men and women, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important trusts in these islands, that thy blessing descend upon us here assembled, and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory, and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of these islands, and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Good morning, members. Good morning. Welcome back. Trust Owen had a good recess. Confirmation of the minutes. Members, the minutes of March 18th and March 22nd have been circulated. Are there any omissions or corrections? No omissions, no corrections. The minutes are confirmed as printed. Messages from the governor? There are none. Announcements by the speaker? Yes, there are three this morning. First, I'm going to ask all members to join and me in standing to give a moment of silence to one of our former members, the Honorable Lloyd James, who was laid to rest while we were absent from this place. And I think it's only due that we recognize a former member in this way. So we'll have a moment of silence beginning now. I thank you, members. The second announcement is that of members who are absent. And you'll note on the order paper that we've received notice that the Honorable Member Gordon Pantelin and the Honorable Member Ben Smith will be absent. We have Mr. Pierman included on that, but we note that Ms. Pierman is actually with us this morning. Thank you. The third announcement this morning is a reminder to members who attended the Parliamentary Stre Strengthening Seminar that all members who attended are required to sign a consent form, meaning, as you know, the CPA like to take photographs and put in their, their, their regular publications of the different CPA events that take place, and it's a requirement of the CPA that you have a signed off consent should you, should you show up in one of those photos. And, we don't know which photos will be used, so all members who attended, if you haven't already signed the consent form, please see Mrs. Place or Mrs. Bowers, and they have the forms in the office here for you to sign. Thank you. And let me say thank you first to all members who did attend. It was greatly appreciated that we had the support of members, and um, we trust that it was most beneficial and enjoyable to all members who were present. Messages from the Senate? There are none. Papers and other communications to the House? Papers and other communications. We have, I believe, four ministers today who have papers and communications for, for the House. 
The first is in the name of the Premier. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you, sir. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit to the information to the Honorable House Assembly, the Labor Advisory Committee, Subcommittee reviewing the Retirement Age 2018 report. Thank you, Premier. The second papers of communications this morning in the name of the Minister of Finance. I believe he has six negative resolutions you'd like to do. And, Minister, you can do them all together. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Good Speaker, morning. I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly the following. Economic Substance Amendment Regulations 2019. Economic Substance Amendment Number 2 Regulations 2019. Companies and Limited Liability Company Beneficial Ownership Transitional Period Extension Order 2019. Partnership, Exempted Partnerships, and Limited Partnership Beneficial Ownership Transitional Period Extension Order 2019. Customs Tariff Approved Business Notice 2019. And Customs Tariff Approved Organizations Amendment Notice 2019. Thank you, Minister. The next paper communication this morning is in the name of the Minister of Health. Minister Wilson, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly the Bermuda Hospitals Board Annual Report 2014. Thank you. The next minister who has papers and communications this morning is that of Minister De Silva, who actually has some 25 negative resolutions. Minister, please do them all together. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly the following. <clears throat> the Merchant Shipping Anti-Falling Systems Regulations 2019, Merchant Shipping Compulsory Insurance of Ship Owners for Maritime Claims Regulations 2019, Merchant Shipping International Safety Management, ISM Code Regulations 2019, Merchant Shipping, Oil Pollution Preparedness, Response and Cooperation Convention Regulations 2019. Merchant Shipping, Port State Control Regulations 2019. Merchant Shipping, Prevention of Air Pollution from Ships Amendment Regulations 2019. Merchant Shipping, Prevention of Oil Pollution Amendment Regulations 2019. Merchant Shipping, Prevention of Pollution from Noxious Liquid Substances in Bulk Regulations 2019, Merchant Shipping Registration of Ships Amendment Regulations 2019, Merchant Shipping Repatriation Amendment Regulations 2019, Merchant Shipping Ship-to-Ship -ship Transfers Regulations 2019, Merchant Shipping Seafarers Employment Amendment Regulations 2019, Merchant Shipping Survey and Cer Certification Regulations 2019, Merchant Shipping and Fishing Vessels, Control of Noise at Work Regulations 2019. Merchant Shipping and Fishing Vessels, Control of Vibration at Work Regulations 2019. Merchant Shipping and Fishing Vessels, Health and Safety at Work, Artificial Optical Radiation Regulations 2019. And Marine Board Control over Maritime Traffic, Number 2, Notice 2019. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, thank you, Honorable Member. The, that brings us to the end of the papers and, communi and communications. Petitions? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, you've done all 25. Yeah, you've done the Marine Boards. Yes. All right. Petitions? There are none. Statements by ministers and State, junior ministers. Statements by ministers and junior ministers. I think we have seven this morning. And the first is in the name of the Premier. Premier, would you like to put your statement? Uh, copies are being circulated now. Yes? Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, there is a growing tendency to use statistics around our declining birth rate and what is referred to as the graying of our population in support of arguments that mitigate against innovation or economic success. 
Make no mistake, the trends are challenging and are not unique to Bermuda. However, the responsibility of leadership is to convert challenging trends into opportunities for growth and sustainability. Mr. Speaker, honorable members will recall this government's 2018 speech from the throne in which we noted the following, and I quote, the time has come to revise the mandatory retirement age to take account of our longer lifespan, the necessity to add stability to pension funds, and to promote greater choice among the working population about when one retires from full-time employment, end quote. Mr. Speaker, in keeping with the promise to invite the legislature to Discuss options for such revisions to the age of mandatory retirement from the public service. Honorable members of the public will have noted from the order paper that I will today table a motion invite this honorable house to agree to the recommendations of the report of the Labor Advisory Subcommittee entitled Reviewing the Retirement Age. Mr. Speaker, as was observed in November's throne speech, and I quote, in many cases the designation senior citizen does not describe our energetic men and women aged 65 and older, end quote. The report now tabled for the consideration of honorable members provides useful details and a sound rationale in support of its recommendations. There is a need to stabilize pension funds, to allow working men and women the benefit of greater capacity to earn and therefore better prepare for eventual retirement and to use a longer lifespan in the modern era to benefit society and the people of Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, following the debate on the report and what I hope will be the unanimous support of this Honorable House and the other place, the government will revert with amendments to the Public Service UPA Annuation Act to give effect to some of these recommendations. I wish to be clear, Mr. Speaker, that this initiative is part of a series of measures which will be implemented by this government to promote more economic activity in Bermuda. The reality of the trends in many societies has caused several countries to take similar steps while concurrently pursuing economic diversification and other growth strategies. We must do the same. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Premier. I believe the next statement is in the name of the Minister of Finance. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Uh, Speaker. Copies being circulated. You have them? Okay, yes. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to provide additional background information regarding the actions which Bermuda has taken to be removed from the EU list of non-cooperative jurisdictions in tax matters as adopted by the EU finance ministers, ECOFIN, at their March 12th uh, meeting. I can report that Bermuda has acted promptly and effectively in order to be formally removed from the EU list, most likely at the May 17 meeting of ECOFIN. On March 28th, Premier David Burt and I met with EU Commissioner Pierre Moscovici, responsible for economic and financial affairs mm -hmm. as well as taxation yes, and customs. Yes, thank you. Thereafter, on April 1st, I met with Mrs. Ludmila Petkova, Chair of the Code of Conduct Group on Business Taxation. These meetings, together with visits to the German and French Ministries of Finance, were open, transparent, and cooperative. They permitted Bermuda to further explain in detail the source, the source and reasons for which there was a technical omission in our economic substance regulation submission. This omission was addressed and corrected to the satisfaction of the European authorities. Subsequent to these meetings, we understand there was a meeting of the Code of Conduct Group on Business Taxation on April 11. Following our meetings and the assurances we received, we have every reason to believe that the EU finance ministers on May 17 will remove Bermuda from Annex 1 of the list of non-cooperative jurisdictions in tax matters, the so-called blacklist. Mr. Speaker, I can add that when Bermuda is removed from Annex 1, we will be placed in Annex 2 of the EU list with three other jurisdictions, Bahamas, British Virgin Islands, and Cayman Islands. This is because of EU concerns regarding the need for a legislative framework for collective investment funds, CIVs, that meet their expectations. Mr. Speaker, we have already committed to continue to cooperate with the EU with respect to the adoption by the end of this year of a proper legislative framework for collective investment funds. Bermuda officials have already engaged last month in a positive dialogue with EU representatives to finalize the scope of the required adjustments to our legislation. We want to ensure an, an efficient implementation 
of our commitments and will carefully address certain concerns raised as they relate to the substance criterion in the CIB's section, sector as required by Annex II jurisdictions. Mr. Speaker, the Bermuda-EU relationship is well developed. For example, our industry sectors have many clients in the EU and economic studies indicate that the value of Bermuda's financial contribution to the EU is significant. More than 10 European Union countries export about $6 billion in goods and services, and annual two-way trade is normally $30 billion between the EU and Bermuda. Bermuda's economy supports almost 150,000 jobs in the European Union market through trade, the foreign direct investment of its multinationals, and its portfolio investment capacity, mostly in the UK, Germany, France, and Ireland. Mr. Speaker, most of this trade between Bermuda and the EU is in the areas of reinsurance and finance. Mr. Speaker, I, can also, I also wish to recognize the cooperation the government received from industry stakeholders throughout the process. It was remarkable. I want to thank all stakeholders for their support and, shows, and show of unity. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The next statement on the order paper this morning is in the name of the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to inform this Honorable House about new initiatives the Department of Planning are expecting to introduce to streamline processes to support the construction and development industry over the course of this financial year. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Members would most likely be familiar with the required planning process one needs to navigate in order to obtain permission to build. It is a widely held belief that the process is slow and cumbersome. There are some who would even suggest that planning is impeding opportunities to encourage and attract investment. This government does not desire any department to be perceived in this fashion. This government recognizes the crucial role that the Department of Planning plays in facilitating and supporting new investment and as such is desirous to improve procedures that will result in more efficient decision making and overall unburden the process. Mr. Speaker, there are a number of initial steps that will be taken in order to achieve improvements. First and foremost, as Minister responsible for the Department of Planning, I will be engaging with key stakeholders from the construction industry on a periodic basis to understand firsthand the range of concerns. Through this dialogue, it is expected that we will be able to discuss the proposed changes and obtain valuable feedback. Mr. Speaker, I must inform you that the Department has invested heavily in the new EnerGov system, which will allow for the electronic submission of applications and provide for an automated and electronic workflow, which will eliminate the generation of paper. It is being tested by staff and stakeholders and will be fully implemented in September. Mr. Speaker, there are a number of areas in which changes are recommended. Firstly, starting with the planning application process. The team has commenced exploring those types of proposals that can be processed administratively and not required to be presented to the Development Applications Board, DAB, for decision. This procedure, known as the Delegation to Director, is a process that Section 5A of the Development and Planning Act 1974 enables. It is anticipated that this mechanism will greatly reduce processing times in respect of allowing internal approvals for those fully compliant applications and those only requiring minimal discretion. Mr. Speaker, the Department will also be producing guidelines and procedures for, one, emergency applications, and two, to fast-track applications for structures that are temporary in nature, such as seasonal concession stands. The latter process will assist small business entrepreneurs to obtain permission quickly, provided that they meet certain guidelines that will be made available to the public as soon as they are produced. Mr. Speaker, it is also being acknowledged 
that there are a range of development types that under the Act require permission but are considered de minimis, which means minor in scope. These types of applications, if eliminated, would free up additional resources to delegate to the processing of applications that are more complex in nature. It is the intent to apply a more common sense approach for minor development matters. Mr. Speaker, it is acknowledged that during construction, it is commonplace to make on-site changes. For those minor types of changes, it is currently a laborious route in which to authorize these desired alterations through an application for revision process. Oftentimes, construction has to cease on site while approval is sought thereby adversely interrupting construction timeframes and impacting jobs on the ground. A criteria will be deployed for the most common types of alterations to enable a sign-off in the field by building inspectors, thereby avoiding the time-consuming revision process. We hope this will assist developments that find themselves in the situation to avoid disruption and planning infractions. It will also facilitate a cooperative approach between the department and the developer. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Planning does have greater enforcement tools. These will be deployed where evidence shows there is that enforcement is necessary. The department intends to provide as much support to agents, contractors, and their clients as is needed to prevent potential infractions as circumstances arise. Mr. Speaker, in the interest of public outreach, it is proposed that the Department of Planning will hold a series of planning clinics in different areas of the island on a quarterly basis where members of the public can obtain planning-related advice and guidance on the submission of applications. It is the aim through this initiative to bring greater public awareness of planning requirements and also to raise the profile of the department. Mr. Speaker, while it's unfortunate to mention, it, it, it must be acknowledged that the department has been often used as a classic scapegoat by agents, which has resulted in unnecessary confusion and frustration for landowners in particular. To this end, the department will be amending its communication structure so that all parties, and I repeat, all parties, including the applicant, agent, and contractor, will simultaneously be in receipt of all correspondence. Concurrently, the department will endeavor to improve its internal communication strategy. Mr. Speaker, we will be introducing legislative changes to allow the Bermuda Plan to become a more fluid document, whereby landowners will not be required to wait every five plus years to request a change to the zoning of their land. At the same time, legislation will be introduced to give protection to, in perpetuity to those areas of conservation value which are increasingly under threat from development, such as woodland and agriculture reserves. Mr. Speaker, the government is pleased to report that following the culmination of the draft New to Plan 2018 process, technical officers will dedicate resources to community planning initiatives for the island's nine parishes. <coughs> It is this initiative that will focus on more of a grassroots approach to planning where residents will have a greater influence over the future of their community. Mr. Speaker, since becoming Minister of Planning, responsible for planning, I have spent time listening to a cross-section of people about their interaction with the department. Generally, planning does a good job. But there are instances where it is clear that the department needs to examine and change, where necessary, its policies and practices. This is acknowledged and is currently being worked on. We will engage regularly with stakeholders in the community to ensure that they 
that we are being responsive to their valid concerns. We have listened, Mr. Speaker, and we are prepared to act. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I am encouraged that the Department of Planning is committed to making necessary changes for the ultimate betterment of Bermuda. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next minister who has a statement on the order paper this morning is that of the Minister Keynes. Minister, would you like to put your statement? If it pleases you, Mr. Speaker. Continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to provide this Honorable House with an update on the Department of Cor Corrections. I would like to say from the outset that we appreciate and value the work of our corrections officers. Mr. Speaker, the health and safety of our corrections officers is paramount. I would also like to highlight that I have the full confidence in the Bermuda Department of Corrections Senior Leadership Team, led by Acting C Commissioner Kiva May Joe Benjamin. Mr. Speaker, most recently, the Prison Officers Association raised significant concerns. The concerns centered around, one, the conditions of the corrections facilities, two, security, and three, health and safety. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, the Bermuda Department of Corrections produced a strategic plan. The aforementioned plan artic articulated a, a systematic method for one, security upgrades, two, personnel development, and three, facility upgrades. Mr. Speaker, most recently, there was an impasse between the Bermuda Department of Corrections Senior Management Team and the POA, the Prison Officers Association. Mr. Speaker, as a result of the aforementioned impasse, a number of the prison officers called in sick. Consequently, there were not enough officers to handle the day-to-day -day operations within the Department of Corrections. Please note that the senior officers were drafted in to carry out the day-to-day -day operations in the housing units within the Department of Corrections. Mr. Speaker, the Bermuda Police Service was used to transport inmates to and from court and to medical visits. The impasse reached fever pitch, and in turn, the Prison Officers Association, the Department of Corrections, the Labor Relations Manager, and the Ministry of National Security Permanent Secretary Colin Anderson men met in an attempt to solve the outstanding issues. Mr. Speaker, there were concerns with reference to the, the corrections officers dealing with mentally ill prisoners and the training that was required to manage the prisoners with mental health issues. There are ongoing discussions with the Ministry of National Security, the Ministry of Health, the Bermuda Hospitals Board to establish a forensic mental health unit here in Bermuda. There is no official timeline as of yet. Mr. Speaker, the Westgate Correctional Facility had limited hot water supply. The budget for the new industrial water heater was recently approved by Cabinet. The industrial water heater will be shipped to the island and will be operational by July 2019. The facility was also in need of two industrial washing machines. One washing machine was purchased in 2018 and is currently in operation and the other industrial washer was recently approved by cabinet and will be on island and in operation by July 2019. There were major leaks in the Westgate water tank. The repairs to the water tank have commenced. Mr. Speaker, the Prison Office Association are deeply concerned with reference to the health of the corrections officers as a result of mold in the, correction, in the corrections facilities, and rightly so. The Acting Commission has implemented a mold remediation and cleaning regime. An air quality assessment is to be completed prior to the end of June 2019, and industrial cleaners will be used to assist with mold remediation in June 2019. The PA, Mr. Speaker, the POA, or the Prison Office Association, have concerns with reference to staff shortages. Please be advised that 25 new corrections officers were hired in September 2018. The recruiting process for 22 new correction officers commenced in May 2019. Training and development of officers is paramount, and so is succession planning. The new senior leadership team have been tasked with discussing the plan with the POA to ensure that the training and development program is robust, is robust and fit for purpose. 
Mr. Speaker, the security within the Department of Corrections was also a concern. A part of the 2017 Corrections Strategic Plan included a security matrix. There are significant elements within the security plan that have been completed or are indeed a work in progress. Mr. Speaker, please note that the duress system in all facilities was recently upgraded. The power unified system, that was recently upgraded. The telephone system was recently upgraded. The fire alarm system was recently upgraded. The infrastructure, the infrastructure system for the security system at the farm facility was upgraded. The infrastructure for the farm facility cameras was also upgraded. Mr. Speaker, at the Westgate Correctional Facility, the CCTV system was upgraded. Cameras were replaced and additional cameras were installed. There was a soft grade upgrade to the Westgate facility camera system. Security fencing at the farm facility was completed. Security fencing at the co-ed correctional facility has commenced and should be completed by the second week in June 2019. Please be advised, Mr. Speaker, that the Cabinet has recently approved a budget for CCTV upgrade at the co-ed facility. Mr. Speaker, there is a security plan in place for drone sightings. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Corrections have trained canine officers who use dogs to assist with drug detection at all of the correction facilities on island. Mr. Speaker, last Friday, representatives from the Ministry of Works from the Ministry of Works and Engineering visited the Westgate Correctional Facility to tour the facility and to put together a list of priorities for maintenance. Mr. Speaker, last week the Prison Office Executive, the Department of Corrections, the Labor Relations Manager, the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of National Security, Mr. Colin Anderson, they met and they distilled all of the outstanding issues with a view to agree upon a way moving forward. Mr. Speaker, the first outcome was that they would create a working maintenance list of issues. The aforementioned maintenance list would be set in order of priority. The parties agreed to set a time continuum with an accompanying schedule, including deadlines. Mr. Speaker, the second outcome was that all of the elements within the strategic plan will be discussed as a standing agenda item at the monthly Department of Corrections and Prison Officer Association meetings. Also, action points will be discussed and the progress signed off by the Prison Officer Association at the end of each meeting. Mr. Speaker, the most significant concern, concerns center around the POA's desire for an increase in pay and the POA membership's payment into the Government Health Insurance Scheme, or the GEHI. Please note that the requested salary increase and payment into the GEHI are subject to the private sector negotiations. Mr. Speaker, the private sector negotiating team and the Prison Officer Association have struggled to come to a consensus read to the terms of reference. Both sides have now come to agreement the terms, are, the terms of reference are now with the Attorney General's Chambers for sign-off. Once the Attorney General's Chambers have signed off on the terms of reference, that both matters will go to the arbitrators and arbitration will commence. Mr. Speaker, please note that in July 2019, personnel from HM Prison Inspectorate will be on island to review all Department of Corrections facilities and will provide an independent assessment of all Department of Corrections processes and procedures. Mr. Speaker, the Prison Officers Association's members continue to work to rule. This means that corrections officers will not work overtime. Programs and classes are restricted. Visits, visits are restricted. Please note that dialogue between the POA, the Department of Corrections, the Ministry of National Security, and the Department of Labor and Training the talks are bearing fruit. All sides are committed to resolving the outstanding issues. Mr. Speaker, the, cor the corrections officer's safety and well-being is paramount. The acting commissioner is tasked 
with executing the 2017 strategic plan. The Prisoners Office Association have highlighted their concerns. The concerns have been taken seriously. The stakeholders must continue to work together to solve the challenges so that the Department of Corrections can get back to the work of regularly scheduled duties. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next minister on the order paper this morning is Minister of Health. Minister Wilson, would you like to put your minister statement? Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker and honorable members, I am very pleased to be tabling in this honorable house today the 2014 annual report for the Bermuda Hospitals Board. This marks what is expected to be a process excuse me, of publishing the next five outstanding annual reports to bring BHB in line with its legislative requirements over the course of the coming fiscal year. Mr. Speaker, I can further provide an update that the 2015 financial statements have already been audited and the annual report is underway. BHB is working with the Auditor General's Office on completing the audits for 2016 to 2019 and will soon be completely up to date. Mr. Speaker, this 2014 annual report provides a summary of activities during the fiscal year under review, along with full financial statements, salary information, and statistics. During that year, BHB managed to end the year with a surplus achieved by reducing budgets by 10 percent and controlling costs. This resulted in a reduction in expenses from $312.3 million to $259 million. These savings were needed to pay for new equipment and ensure financial obligations could be met when the new acute care wing was completed in the summer of 2014. This enabled BHB to financially prepare for the new wing without any additional funds or grants from government. Mr. Speaker, the 2014 annual report gives details of the operational readiness project, which included training and preparing staff and planning moving 90 inpatients over safety, safely. It also highlights service and care improvements in all services provided by the King Edward Memorial Hospital, the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute, and the Lamb Fogo Urgent Care Center campuses at the various BHB run, as well as the various BHB run group homes. To close, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to bringing the future annual reports as they are made ready and to see BHB move forward on its legislated schedule of financial reporting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next minister who has a statement this morning is Minister Fogo. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you, to the House, and to the good people of Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to rise today to provide to the members of this Honorable House an overview of the role and functions of the Labor Relations Section in light of the various concerns and queries that the Ministry of Labor, Community Affairs, and Sports has received recently. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the Labor Relations Section sits within the Ministry of Labor, Community Affairs, and Sports Headquarters and comprises of the Labor Relations Manager, an Administrative Assistant, and three Labor Relations Officers. Mr. Speaker, the role of this section is to educate employers and employees on Bermuda's labor laws, that is, the Employment Act 2000, the Labor Relations Act 1975, the Trade Union Act 1965, and the Labor Disputes Act 1992, to investigate and mediate labor complaints while remaining neutral, to make appropriate referrals of unsettled complaints to the appropriate body for determination, to facilitate the process of union certification and decertification, to prepare for the UK Office International Labor Organization reports and to promote amicable and productive industrial relations within Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, the Labor Relations Section has various functions under each of the aforementioned acts, which I will now expound upon. The Employment Act 2000, this sets out the minimum standards for the terms and conditions of employment for persons working full-time in Bermuda and comprises the majority of the work managed by the Labor Relations Section. The Labor Relations Officer conducts an investigation into a complaint made pursuant to this Act and mediates the parties to a resolution. And see, if a resolution cannot be reached, the complaint will be referred to the Employment Tribunal for determination. 
Under the Labor Relations Act 1975, the Act establishes and governs the procedure for the settlement of labor disputes within essential industries and essential services. The Labor Relations Officer conducts an investigation of a labor dispute pursuant to the, this Act and mediates the parties to a resolution. If a resolution cannot be really re-reached, the labor dispute will be referred to the Minister responsible for labor for consideration and referral to the appropriate board or arbitration panel. Those panels are the Permanent Arbitration Tribunal, the Essential Industrial Dispute Settlement Board, a mediator, a sole arbitrator, or an arbitrator and assessors. Under the Labor Disputes Act 1992, it establishes a labor disputes tribunal where it is expedient for the settlement of certain labor disputes within a non-essential service or industry. If a resolution cannot be reached and both parties do not consent to the referral of a labor dispute under the Labor Relations Act 1975, the labor dispute will be referred to the Minister for consideration and referral to the Labor Disputes Tribunal. Under the Trade Union Act 1965, this act governs the certification and decertification of unions in the private and public sectors. The Labor Relations Officer reviews the certification application and assists the parties in determining the appropriate bargaining unit and conducts a secret ballot of the workers to certify whether or not a union will act as their sole bargaining agent. Parties have a right to appeal the order, granting or refusing certification. The Labor Relations Officer, upon receipt of an application for decertification from the workers within a bargaining unit, inquires into the appropriateness of the existing bargaining unit and conducts a secret ballot of the workers to determine whether or not the certification of the union will be cancelled. Mr. Speaker, as announced in the throne speech, the Minister of Labor, Community Affairs and Sports, working together with the unions and employer groups, will modernize the current labor legislation, that is, the Employment Act 2000, the Labor Relations Act 1975, the Labor Disputes Act 1992, and the Trade Union Act 1965 to ensure protections for employees, whether unionized or not. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Labor, Community Affairs and Sports has received a number of complaints from workers and members of the public pertaining to unfair contractual terms and the perceived disproportionate treatment of Bermudian and expatriate workers. Workers are urged to address any and all concerns and or complaints with the Labor Relations Section, which is responsible for the investigation and conciliation of all employment and labor-related disputes. Mr. Speaker, the Labor Relations Section is located at 23 Parliament Street, Hamilton, in the Old Magistrate's Court Building. They are open Monday to Friday from 8.45 to 5 p.m. and can be reached on 2977-1474 or 2977-716. And the office welcomes walk-ins as well as appointments, Mr. Speaker. The section will, be shortly, will shortly be commencing an educational campaign to advise employees of their rights under the various acts. I urge any employee who requires assistance or advice to contact the session, section who are there to provide just that, advice and assistance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member Fogo. The next minister, final statement this morning, is that of the Minister of Transport. Minister Silva. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Right. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Public Transportation implemented a new 50 bus schedule on the 18th of March, 2019, to provide a reduced bus, public bus service that could be reliably met with the available buses and no cancellations. However, the frequency and capacity of the new schedule was insufficient to meet the demands of our commuters, visitors, and students. Additionally, there were challenges with the rest times between some trips, presenting health and safety concerns for not only bus operators and the traveling public. As a result, it was decided to reinstate the previous schedule, effective 29 April 2019. The 2019 bus schedule was closely monitored over a period of six weeks consolidating feedback from bus operators and the public. 
The decision to revert to the former schedule was not taken lightly, but was the only recourse to address the concerns of our operators and passengers. Mr. Speaker, implementing the 2019 bus schedule was a learning curve and is an advancement to build on as we move forward. The ministry, unions, and the DPT have forced, fostered a stronger working relations uh, demonstrated in part by our ability to agree the definition of night work. Um, and I think that deserves repeating, Mr. Speaker. Demonstrated in part by our ability to agree the definition of night work and collectively develop and implement work rosters. Once implemented, we consulted on the performance of the new schedule and decisions were made in the best interests of the public and our employees. Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to delivering a quality public bus service. As such, replenishing the bus fleet remains a priority for the DPT. Over the past year, the average in service bus count has increased from 50 buses up to 65 buses. This was accomplished through a combination of new bus purchases, midlife refits, and out of service repairs. We have taken delivery of six new buses in the past year with a further six new buses arriving between June and September this year. In addition, DPT has recently concluded a request for information for new buses and is in the process of preparing a request for proposal. We are taking this opportunity to review the bus market and available vehicle types that meet Bermuda's needs, as well as international public transportation standards. This includes consideration for sustainability and the environment appropriately sized buses, accessibility, onboard features, and the total cost of ownership. The informa information gathered during the RFI process is encouraging, and we are confident that there are solutions that can replenish the bus fleet in a timely manner and improve the bus service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. That brings us to a conclusion of the statements for this morning. Reports of committees. There are none. Premier's question. Premier's question time. Yes, members. Just as a reminder, on the Premier's questions, the Leader of the Opposition may ask three questions. Any other member may ask one question only. And only members asking the question may be afforded two supplementary, supplemental questions. Again, the time period for this is 30 minutes. And that 30 minutes is the first 30 minutes of the entire 60 minutes that are allowed for the full question period. So with that, we'll start our question period. And Mr. Premier, there are members of the opposition who have indicated they have questions for you as well as others. And the first question is in the name of the opposition leader. Opposition leader, would you like to put your question? Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Uh, and to the House and visitors. Uh, first question I have um, <clears throat> to our Honorable Premier. Uh, there was a lot of uh, um, excitement around a particular company, uh, Persid, um, who in the Persid, in Persaid, sorry, Persaid, yes, uh, Persaid, uh, S E I D, Persaid, uh, who uh, won awards away for interesting technology that it was bringing forward to, uh, to light. And uh, quite frankly, uh, I think we were all excited about the fact that there was uh, an MOU that was being signed by the government uh, with this particular company in conjunction with another company using Shift. Um, so I wanted to find out from the uh, Premier, uh, where are we? We understand that it was supposed to kick off some time um, the first quarter that has passed uh, in February. I'd like to know where are we uh, with this particular great opportunity that we understand would have even been lucrative for our Bermuda government at some point in time. If you could give us an update on what's happening. Thank you. Now, Mr. Leader, Mr. Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in regards to the question from the opposition leader, I believe the opposition leader is asking about the government's EID project, uh, which has been spoken about on numerous occasions. Last year, <clears throat> almost about a year ago, I believe, at the consensus conference um, in New York City, there was a uh, joint venture signed where a Canadian company, uh, per, uh, Shift, 
uh, invested in a Bermuda company or formed a joint venture with Bermuda company, Trunomi, to create a company per se. Per se was to work with the government of Bermuda to, on the implementation of an electronic identity plan. I'm not going to get into the details uh, because I do not want to discuss internal issues with particular companies as they exist, but needless to say, there were some particularly challenges with the execution of this particular ar arrangement. Discussions continue with the government of Bermuda. Uh, discussions happened as recently as two weeks ago. Um, we will continue to do it, and the intent is to implement an electronic identity pilot this year. However, Mr. Speaker, as honorable colleagues may know, but those persons who are familiar with the distributed ledger technology space do know, is that changes in technology, as this is a nascent technology, happen very quickly. The government is looking to adjust its approach to the electronic identity project, as opposed to having one vendor and or one system being tied in that may expose the government to technology risk in the future, as we do not know how the system will develop. We are looking at implementing a regulatory framework, which we are calling the Reliance Framework, which will basically allow multiple different companies to be able to attest to and verify the identities of persons, and that is thought as a process which will broaden this identity project. Per se, will still be used to do the pilot of that, and that is a negotiation which we're currently doing. But the government um, is working with the, the, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology on developing the Reliance Framework, and we look forward to updating members of that once that is passed through the Cabinet. Thank you. Uh, Officer Sleater, would you like to put a supplementary yeah. or a new question? Certainly. No, 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 no. Uh, supplementary. Supplementary? Uh, okay. Appreciate uh, some of the, the update. There. I just want to be sure, so I'm, I'm understanding correctly, the MOU then still is in place. Uh, we are still continuing uh, with PERSAID. Um, and I guess like, the question then would be, is the commitment still to invest the $10 million that they said they also would be investing in the next three years? Has any of the conditions of that MOU changed since the uh, revelation of working with uh, the university that you just mentioned and the likes? Thank you. Opposition, Premier? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I may believe that the opposition leader may be talking about two different particular issues. There is the joint venture between Trunomi and Shift, and then there is the MOU itself with Shift. And so there has been no change on either one of those processes. Okay. The government continues to engage with those companies. However, as technology moves very quickly, that was signed a year ago, the space itself is evolving rapidly. The analysis that the government has done, um, which is being spearheaded by the chief fintech advisor, uh, Mr. Dennis Pitcher, working with MIT is to look at a broader framework, which we believe can bring more adoption to electronic identity in Bermuda and advance the pace of, I would say, Bermuda as being a center in this space. This is very hard stuff to explain because it is incredibly technical. It is very difficult for me to understand. That's why I'm fortunate to have someone like Dennis Pitch who understands this particular stuff, but we are changing it. So there has been no change in the MOU with Shift. Perseid is the entity that is continuing to work with the government to launch the pilot. And once we, once we confirm the parameters of that, because what is most important, Mr. Speaker, is that the government's interests and the country's interests are um, advanced in the best way. Thank you. Premier, uh, supplementary? Yes. Second yes. supplementary? Um, appreciate that. And I, I just want to say in asking this question, uh, I, I think it's a great idea, uh, this whole process. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, as we move forward, the Premier mentioned that um, within the year, um, uh, are we saying that we will have something established as far as a digital ID uh, by another year from now? Is that what you're saying? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Speaker um, I'm happy to respond to that. As the Honorable Member would know, and updates were given by the Minister who was previously sponsored and, my, and myself, we, this is something that we wanted to have done already. But as the old adage says, measure twice, cut once. Things are advancing very quickly, and we do not want to have ourselves trapped in with, as is called an IT, 
technology risk. And that is the reason why we are making sure that we are analyzing this carefully. I would love to give the opposition leader a specific timeline on when this would be. I cannot present that at this time, as the government is still working with Prasad to outline exactly the parameters of what the pilot would look like in conjunction with the budgeted amount that has been approved by the Cabinet of Bermuda. Thank you. Opposition leader, you are done with the supplementaries for your first question. Would you like to put your second question? Uh, is, is two, two, oh, two right. supplementaries. I was trying to cheat to get three. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yes, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> move on. Uh, we have a, a, a statement given to us uh, concerning the um, um, negotiations and issues with uh, the prisons. What I wanted to find out, and I uh, adjust this question just slightly, I was going to ask about the prisons and the police, but I wanted to find out from the uh, Premier if he can give us um, an idea of where we are with the negotiations concerning uh, the police department. Uh, we know that it has been ongoing, uh, and uh, in light of the fact that we have issues with the uh, correctional services, where are we now with the police department negotiations? Thank you. Premier? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will just state that on the top of my head, I do not uh, know the exact status of, of the negotiations with uh, the uh, police officers. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will seek to uh, get the minister, and I can, uh, the opposition leader, and can uh, write with clarity on that. The minister for the cabinet office is the one who holds those particular responsibilities. And I'm very sorry that I do not have that update, but I'll look to provide it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Supplementary? Yes, your first supplementary. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Take, taking, that, taking that into consideration, uh, we know that it has been a major concern um, with both uh, departments, uh, Correctional Services and uh, the Police Department. I would hope that uh, we, can, we can get an update. And in addition to understanding exactly what is going on, find out uh, what are the major concerns so that we can move along in resolving this, understanding that both Correctional Services and Police Department work hand in hand with one another. We don't want a situation whereby we're having more sick out, sit out, and that kind of a thing. Thank you. Thank you. Premier? Mr. Speaker, I agree um, with the sentiments expressed by the opposition leader. Clearly, this is a challenge that the former government had as according to this government. And one of the major sticking points with both the prison officers and the police is the um, the issue with GEHI contributions. It's something that was inside of throne speeches from the former government, and it's something that is continued to be worked on on this government. And for the public's edification, there are about seven different public sector uh, unions and negotiating bodies, and not all of them pay into the government employees' health insurance scheme at the same rate. And that is one of the major sticking points in both, as the minister uh, for national security had mentioned with the uh, prison officers, and that's also one of the uh, challenges and sticking points uh, with the uh, police officers as well. Uh, officers leader, you have a second supplementary, or you want no, to go to your that's the, yeah. go to your third question? Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We look forward to an update uh, con concerning the matter that I know that they are taking uh, into hand. Uh, yeah, the third question that I do have uh, is. Since the election of 2000, July 2017, if, could the uh, Premier let us know, has any ministers or junior ministers been hired as consultants or been paid to do work in addition to being appointed as minister or junior ministers since that period of time? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, um, I, I will try to uh, get answers off the top of the head. The only... Um, outside of regular service on government boards. Um, I do not believe so. The only thing would possibly be uh, the Efficiency Committee, uh, which I believe was shared by the Junior Minister uh, for Finance, which had multiple members uh, which were remunerated, uh, which did work, but I don't uh, necessarily, off the top of my head, um, have any specifics on that. Thank you. Supplementary? Yes, yeah, supplementary. Uh, yes. Mr. Speaker, thank you for uh, the Premier's willing to take that on hand. And if, if, if the um, Premier could also uh, allow us or let us know uh, for what ministries those were for uh, and approximately what the, where the amounts for those uh, contracts uh, that may have been meted out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Premier? Mr. Speaker, I don't believe that there was any particular contracts uh, which were stated. Um, I believe under the Constitution. 
Um, section 614 of the Bermuda Constitution allows all ministers to appoint uh, boards and committees to advise uh, particular ministers. Um, I know the Efficiency Committee um, did excellent work, um, and with that excellent work, I know that there were a number of members on it uh, from both uh, sides of um, the boat, from both places. Uh, including um, independent senators and others, and the work of which they do, hopefully we'll be able to bring to this House in the near future. Thank you. Uh, second Thank you, supplementary, Speaker. you're fine? Okay. That uh, brings us to a close. Other questions from the opposition leader? The next member who has questions is MP Jean Edithen. Member, member, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, to, through you to the Premier, can the Premier advise, and this is relating to the FinTech Development Fund, that was introduced in 2018. Can the Premier advise how much money has been deposited into the FinTech Development Fund? And what was, and in those monies deposited, what was the specific purposes for such sums received in the other purposes and category? But, Mr. Speaker, though it is two questions I'm happy to answer. As has been stated uh, previously, um, in both the media and in this house, the last time of asking at this point in time, there I was pausing because I was going to see if I would make them into two separate, but B, you want to take them as one. There has been no deposits to the FinTech Development Fund, and when there are deposits to the FinTech Development Fund, I can assure the members of the opposition that they will know. Thank you. Supplementary? I thought I had a supplementary. You, you used it twice, see? You used up both your questions. I, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, going to be, I'm going to make sure that, I'm, that it's clear. Um, the other part of the act envisioned that the government could put some monies into the um, FinTech Development Fund. I just want clarity that the government itself has not deposited any money into the fund. Premier? Mr. Speaker, the government has not. Thank you. Another supplementary? You have two supplementaries. Would you like to use your second? Or we yeah, can I'm, going, I'm, use my, I'm going to um, use your last use supplementary. Last one. Yes. And, and I'm doing this for clarity because um, the, other, the, other, the reason when the fund was set up, it was envisioned that monies would be paid out to, uh, for te technical education for individuals and for sporting organizations. And I'm just trying to clarify that because no money has been paid into that fund, no money has been distributed to community organizations or for the purposes of um, technical education. Mr. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I think that the honorable member has answered her own question. Thank you. Okay. Mem members, members. The, thank you. The next member, Premier, has questions for you. The honorable member, uh, MP Dunkley. MP, would you like to put your questions? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, good morning to you and to honorable colleagues. Question to the honorable premier. Members. Honorable premier, on the 11th of March, you delivered a ministerial statement to this house titled Professional Service Consultants and Advisors, a revised contract. In it, you stated that you would surely invite Cabinet to approve amendments to relevant legislation to formalize ministerial private offices. You also stated that you had invited the policy and strategy section within the Cabinet office to conduct a jurisdictional review of consultants. Honorable Premier, can you please update this Honorable House on these two items? Premier. Mr. Speaker, happy to update the Honorable House on these two items. Um, as has been stated uh, by the Honorable uh, Former Premier's question, um, what has been promised in the speech um, has been done. Uh, reviews have been carried out not only uh, for a proposed code of conduct uh, for ministerial private offices, but also revisions to legislation, and I would expect to be bringing that uh, legislation to the, this Honorable House next week. Thank you. Supplementary? No supplementaries? The next member, Premier, has a question for you. Honorable member... Mr. Simons, Honorable Member Simons, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, during the 2018-19 budget debate press briefing, the Premier promised that there will be no closures or mergers of Bermuda public schools. And he said, he went on to say that this is not something that we're looking to do right now. Can the Premier give us an update as to his intentions for this year? 
will he be closing or merging any public schools? Premier. Mr. Speaker, the first thing I can say is I don't uh, fully recall uh, saying that, but if the honorable uh, member says that, I will take him at his word. What I can say, however, is that this government was elected with a promise to phase out middle schools, and we are currently engaged in that process. We are measuring multiple times, and um, so we only have to cut once. But what I will say, Mr. Speaker, is when we're talking on the topic of schools that have been closed, I think it is very interesting to note on the issue of T.N. Tatum. And the reason why I say on the issue of T.N. Tatum, Mr. Speaker, is that it is very important to note that when the former government was in office, they were provided with recommendations on what to do to fix the source of the problems at the school. And guess what? They didn't fix the source of the problems. They did cosmetic cleaning. We have now received a report on the full extent of which is required to fix the source of the problems, to prevent the problems from reoccurring, and those are the things which will be examined. So the only school at this time which is closed, unfortunately, is due to the negligence of the former side not following the advice of which they were given and fixing the problems at the source as opposed to, as opposed to doing cosmetic work. Ma'am, would you like to put your supplementary? Yes. I have one question and two supplementaries, right? One question, two supplementaries, okay, correct. This is your good. first supplementary, no? Okay, my first supplementary. Um, what was the source of the document that the Premier was referring to? Premier, would you like to put your question? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, there are a number, but the source of the report, um, I have it here in front of me. Happy to table it for the Ottawa members' um, attention. Um, it was written um, to Mr. Dwayne Casey, Facilities Manager for Bermuda Water Consultants, and it says, in our opinion, that everything that we observed is directly related to general and routine maintenance facility. The issues that we noted today are the same issues that we noted back in 2013 and the same issues that closed out in 2017. And that was roof leaks, which were not fixed, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Second supplementary. Second supplementary. Um, during last year's comments, the, the Premier also said we're looking right now in ensuring that we improve the outcomes of public education system. Can the Premier give us an update as to when he can expect for the public and the House to get the results of the Cambridge Middle School exams that took place in early 2019? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I do not know the exact timing of that, but I will ask the Minister of Education to speak to the Shadow Minister to provide him, um, to provide him uh, that particular update on the timing of the release of those particular figures. Thank you. That brings you to a close of questions from the Honourable Member. Premier, you have another Honourable Member who has questions for you this morning, and it's the Honourable Member Pearman. Honourable Member, would you like to put your question? Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Premier. Good morning. Good morning. As you know, there is an ongoing investigation into the Department of Child and Family Services being conducted by the Department of Internal Audit. Can the Premier share with the House and the people of Bermuda when that uh, investigation is likely to be concluded and a report produced? Thank you. Mr. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I do not believe that there is an ongoing investigation. I believe that that investigation has concluded. That is the best of my knowledge, but I'm happy to check. But it is my understanding that that investigation has been concluded. Okay. Honourable Member, you have a supplementary, yes? Honourable Premier, given the importance of this matter to the public and to Bermuda, um, will that be a report that you yourself will be considering? Premier? Mr. Speaker, I am going to try and go back from memory on internal audit reports, but I don't think that internal audit reports actually go to ministers. The Department of Internal Audit um, and the Internal Audit Act, I think, specifically restricts the interference of ministers in internal audit items. So those items are administrated by the Cabinet Secretary. That is the best of my knowledge in regarding the Internal Audit Act. Uh, second supplementary? Second supplementary. Yes. Uh, given the importance of this report, is the Honorable Premier prepared to consider whether to make it public? Premier? Mr. Speaker, I do not actually believe that that is allowable under our law. 
Um, however, I am happy to uh, discuss the matter, and possibly it might be something that a parliamentary committee may be able to request. Thank you. That actually brings us to a close of questions from the opposition. I do believe we have some questions from government members, and I believe the it's, it's actually eight minutes and 25 seconds left, so you've got some time there. The first, I believe, is from the Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, the Progressive Labor Party election platform stated that the government would reform public education by phasing out middle schools and introducing signature schools at the secondary level which focuses on the learning styles and interests of our children, including academic, tactical, and other trades, business, sports, arts, and special needs education. Will the Honorable Premier please inform this Honorable House the status of this election process? Thank you. Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Honorable Deputy Speaker for his uh, question. Uh, the Ministry of Education has been uh, reviewing the outline of this current system, as I had said um, in uh, responses to questions from the opposition earlier, that this is something that we're making sure that we analyze fully, as these are our children, and we want to make sure that any changes that are done to the system are done in the best interest of our children. The Cabinet recently had a presentation on possible construction of new schools and system redesign, and the Cabinet has asked for additional information, Mr. Speaker, as is the Cabinet's view that we can not only deal with the matters of buildings and facilities as we look to uh, phase out middle schools, but we also have to look at accountability for teachers and administrators as well. So that is particular information the Minister of Education, as I discussed this morning, said that he is aiming to have that information to the Cabinet as is requested in July, and at that point in time, I'm certain that the Minister of Education will engage in public um, in public consultation on this particular matter. Thank you. Supplementary. Supplementary? Yes, Mr. Speaker. I know many of my constituencies voted for the PLP based on this pledge. When I go knock on doors, what can I tell my constituency is the timeline to deliver this election promise? Thank you. Premier? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And um, I think that I'm on public record of saying this, and I will say that ideally, uh, the next school year, which is 2019-2020, will be the, the last school year under our system, uh, under the current system, and that the school year 2020-21 will be the first with signature schools. However, Mr. Speaker, and I want to say this, the government will not rush this just to make this particular timeline. These are our children, and especially as my daughter will be starting in the public school system uh, in the fall, I want to ensure that we probably don't measure two times but three times before we cut once. But it is my every expectation that this will be delivered before we go back to the polls. Thank you. No supplementary. The next member, the government whip. The next, okay. MP Tyrrell, would you like to still put your question? Uh, good morning, Mr. Speaker. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can the Honorable Premier please inform this Honorable House what measures are being taken to make this government more efficient? Yes. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honorable Member for his question, because oftentimes we hear um, lots of particular issues about misinformation. And there's one thing that I want to certainly bring to the fore, because I think that it is critically important that people understand the truth. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to uh, read to you two figures. I'm going to read to you the total number of employees employed by the government of Bermuda on the 31st of March, 2015. That number was 5,039. On the 31st of March, 2019, the end of the last fiscal year, that number was 4,704, a decline of 335 persons. Mr. Speaker, mm -hmm. not only have we worked in making sure that we are not, we are constraining and making sure the public service is efficient, we are also, Mr. Speaker, as I said, had the work of the Efficiency Committee, which was led by the former Junior Minister of Finance. There are a number of recommendations which they made which have been implemented. 
one recommendation collected over $4 million of taxes by examining uh, departments. There's another thing of which the Efficiency Committee has actually also uh, commented on, which will streamline the process for approvals for land. In addition, the Minister of uh, Home Affairs just spoke about the efficiency measures which are going to be taken for the Department of Planning. There's a number of things that we're making sure to be efficient, but the most important thing, Mr. Speaker, is we live within our means. And it's important to correct the false narrative that is out there and recognize that between 2015 and today, there are 335 less persons employed by the governor of Utah, not more as the opposition would lead you to believe. Thank you, Premier. <laughs> supplementary? Uh, 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 suppl you can't add supplementaries. Supplementary? <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. The, Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, um, I think we should be sharing more of the Mr. members, members, Mr. Speaker, members. I think we should be sharing more of the good work that this government is doing. Uh, will the Honorable Premier look to be tabling any reports of the Efficiency Committee in the House? Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honorable Member for his question. What I will um, ask the uh, Minister for the Cabinet Office to do is to review that report as it did go into a number of sensitive topics, and we want to make sure that there are certain things that are possibly may not be suitable for public dissemination, but certainly the report and any appendixes which can be released, I think we should, because it's important that people know the work of the Efficiency Committee. The Thank you, Ms. Gerald. You used up your questions. The next member who has a question for the Premier is Honorable Member Famous. Honorable Member Famous, would you like to put your question? Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Huh? Mr. Speaker, in 2017, the Progressive Labor Party platform, election platform stated the government would, and I quote, collaborate with Bermuda College to promote mobile application apps development skills by having students design, maintain, and enhance mobile apps that make government better and more efficient. Would the Honorable Premier please inform this Honorable House the status of this election promise? Premier. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Honorable Member. Uh, the Honorable Member, uh, will or the public should know that we have delivered on that particular election promise. I was proud to announce uh, for a few weeks ago that we had launched the Governor of Bermuda's first mobile application, which was designed by students at the Bermuda College in conjunction with an overseas firm. That app um, provided practical experience to students at the Bermuda College, but the government is not stopping there. We are upgrading the computer labs at the Bermuda College to provide more instruction and more allowance uh, for students to have these experiences, and those persons are going to have the opportunity to work on that, and more persons that are coming to the program at the Bermuda College as we continue to prepare Bermudians for a future of technology. Thank you. Is this supplementary? Yes. Uh, supplementary? Yes. Could the Honorable Premier tell us exactly how many times has the app been downloaded? Because that will be a true measure of its success thus far. Thank you. Premier? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, what I will say is that the total number of application downloads as of May 7th totaled the number of 300. So we have some work to do to get that number up. Thank you. No more supplementary from that member? There's 12 seconds left. I was going to call on Ms. Ferber. If Ms. Ferber, you'd like to use your well, eight seconds now, or we can move on to the other questions. Because you know, it looks like time's going to run out Thank before you, you get Speaker. to Twitter. I think, I <laughs> think the time has run out. <laughs> Thank you. We're now going to move on to the questions from today's statements. And the first, quest, first statement was in the name of the Premier. And Premier, you actually have a question from a member. And call on the other Honorable Member Simons. Honorable Member, um, would you like to put your question? For the Premier. For the Premier. Well, would you like us to move on? Uh, <laughs> okay, you, you came back the second time. All right, we'll move on, Premier. The next um, statement is that of the Minister of Finance. And Minister, you have two members who would like to put questions to you. The first was from the Member uh, Pearman, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, you spoke in your statement about the uh, forthcoming legislative framework of uh, changes for the collective investment funds. Uh, as per previous 
uh, are you prepared to give an undertaking that you will consult with the industry stakeholders uh, and additionally to provide draft legislation well in advance of the debate in the House? Thank you. Minister? Uh, the responsibility for the legislation uh, around regulations around collective investment funds is rests with the BMA. Um, as per their standard practice of consultation and drafting, I suspect that they will follow the norm and um, consult and uh, provide drafts as appropriate. Supplementary or? Okay. I will move on. Mr. Simons, you have a question for the Minister of Finance? The Minister's statement indicated, um, Mr. Speaker, I should add that when Bermuda is removed from Annex 1, we will be placed on Annex 2 of the EU list. Can the Minister confirm that by going on Annex 2, we will be going on the grey list and not the white list? Thank you. Minister? Annex 2 is the great list. Supplementary, yes. Yes. Can um, the minister give a roadmap for, as to what we need to do to get onto the white list? Minister? I've been informed that the resolution of the issues surrounding collective investment funds will be the, the, the issue that takes us from gray to white. Thank you. Supplementary? Supplementary? Thanks. And what type of timeline will we have um, in place to have this board to completion? Minister? We are anticipating getting appropriate guidance from the European Commission in June or July of this year with an expectation that we'll have our submissions made by the end of the year. Thank you. No more questions? Good. We move on to the next statement. The next statement is in the name of the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, you have a question from the Honourable Member Simons again. Honourable Member Simons, would you like to put your question? Okay. Um, in regards to streamlining the planning process, how will this streamlining process impact the Development Application Board? Premier, uh, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the things that one of the streamliners will do, it will avoid a certain type of applications we no longer have to go to the board and will be administratively approved as long as they meet certain requirements, particularly if it's a standard application where all the boxes have been ticked, it, it, is, it fits in all the development requirements and it will not need to go to the board. So that means that there is a considerable percentage of applications that will no longer be slowed by having to be prepared for the board process. And that should compact the development application process for those types of applications. Thank you. Uh, supplementary? Yes, so we'll be, be bringing um, amendments to the Planning Act and planning regulations to facilitate this change of responsibility and function. Thank you. Deputy? It was outlined in my statement, Mr. Speaker, Section 5A of the Planning Act already allows for this procedure. Thank you. Any further questions? No further questions. Deputy, that was the only questions for you. We now move on to the fourth statement. That was in the name of the Minister of National uh, Security. Minister, you have a few members who would like to put questions to you, and the first was the opposition leader. Would you like to put your question now? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and thank you, the Honourable Member, for the uh, statement, um, which we believe was timely. Um, I'd like to find out on, on one of the pages, I don't, it's not numbered, I don't know which one it is, but um, uh, he mentions that there's a security plan in place uh, for, for drone sightings, and uh, we recall some of the situations that happened in the past. Can you give us kind of like a, just an overview, because obviously details are, uh, we want to leave out but an overview of what that might look like uh, to ensure the um, – so, um, so that we understand what the security plan is. Minister? I'll take your guidance, Mr. Speaker. I, 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 I do think that there is a security plan. I do not believe it wise to discuss the, the security plan in, in, in open, in earnest. There is a, a, is a plan yeah, yeah, that deals yeah, with the yeah, reporting yeah. elements of it. There is a plan in place to get a technical uh, uh, device on island to deal with it. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if that proves, proves helpful. 
Thank you, Minister. Yeah, yeah, is that okay? Yeah, well, I guess, guess what I want to find out, um, mentioning we did talk about getting something, getting something put in uh, place and getting uh, equipment here. Is there any timeline that you've given these guys to get that equipment here, c considering the uh, severity of this issue? The government has a procurement process. It's going through the, to the procurement process, right. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary, fine. Minister, the next question would be from the Honourable Member uh, Donkley. Honourable Member, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to the Honourable Minister, on page five of the statement, the Minister mentions the most significant concern centered around the POA's desire for an increase in pay. Um, in regards to that, what has been budgeted in this financial year for the pay increase? Minister? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'll have to come back to that and, and, and give me two seconds. I need to look at the budget book and I'll get that and come back, Mr. Speaker. Hey, the Minister's indicating he'll have to uh, retrieve that figure for you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary? Supplementary, yes. Um, carrying on from that on page five and page six, it says the terms of reference have been agreed on both sides and they're now with the Attorney General's Chambers for sign-off. Um, once they're signed off, the, the matter will go to arbitration. How long does the Honorable Minister think it will take to get these terms of reference signed off so it can go to arbitration? Minister? That's an administrative process. I've spoken to the Attorney General. That is to happen eminently, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary? Supplementary. Supplementary. Second supplementary, yes. yes. Mr. Speaker. Um, carrying on that page, page six, the uh, Honorable Minister says the POA members continue to work to rule, and this means that corrections will not work over time. Programs and all classes are restricted. Visits are restricted. So the question to the Honorable Minister is, what is the meaning of restricted? Specifically, what program and classes are being conducted, and how are restricted visits con conducted? Who gets permission to get in? Minister? Mr. Speaker, it, it, it means just that. There is a regular schedule. There is, uh, prisoners are allowed to leave their cells. Prior to this, uh, the agreement, the temporary agreement coming into place, prisoners were under lockdown. Since the agreement has come into place, prisoners are no longer on lockdown. The classes, they are not having classes at the moment. They're restricted. They're not taking place. The object in this enterprise is for both sides to get to the table and as soon as possible have all the services um, going. Mr. Speaker, we know that it's not convenient for all of the classes which are not taking place. It's not convenient for all of the visits that are li limited. The object is to get both sides back at the table forthwith so we can have the, uh, the, the, the business uh, uh, working as soon as possible. Thank you. Supplementary or new question? I'll actually have to be a new question. You used your two supplementaries. Right? Uh, yes, sir. I was, I was going to say that. <laughs> yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, next question. Um, on page three, the Honorable Minister says the POA have concerns with references to staff shortages. And in that regard, the uh, Commission of Corrections has been seconded under the PLP for some time now. Is it intended the Commission returns, and if so, when? Uh, Minister? Uh, Ms. Mr. Speaker, we believe that the commissioner will not return. We believe that this commissioner is acting. It is a, she has all of the responsibilities. She has full access to the budget. She has full dominion over the staff. We believe that it's simply an exercise. The, the civil service has a significant procedure with reference to the, the substantive, uh, the substantive commissioner of prisons is working as a permanent secretary. There are plans afoot to regularize that. As soon as that is available, we will, we will see uh, 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 specific administrative things taking place. Thank you. Supplementary? We'll take a supplementary from the Deputy Opposition Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister, in his statement on page 3, the recruiting process for 22 corrections officers started in March. Have you identified anybody to be hired up to this, from that date to this date, please? Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we know, there is a period of place where people have the opportunity to, to put in requests. So there is a position uh, when you do a recruiting process, the dates for re uh, recruitment are from the 22nd of March until the specific date. The officers now are 
getting all the applications in. They are vetted. They are doing security tests. They're doing physical tests. They're doing academic tests. At the end of that, in that process, we get a field of candidates. They go through a battery of tests. And at the end of that process, we have, what we believe, a starting a cohort of officers that will commence the process to go through to uh, become corrections officers, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary, new question. Supplementary. To you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, on the top of page two, the Honorable Minister says that most recently there was an impasse between the Department of Corrections Senior Management and the Prisoners' Office Association. Exactly what was this impasse over and how many officers called in sick at that time? Um, Approximately 36 officers called in sick. The impasse centered around security concerns. I went through each one of the con security concerns in uh, the statement. It centered around concerns around the, the, uh, around the physical plant. I went through each one of the elements that um, were, con were considered uh, in the statement as well, Mr. Speaker. The third issue, which we could not discuss because they form, fell under the public service uh, negotiation parts, Mr. Speaker, that was the GEHI contribution and the salary incre increase, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. A second supplementary, a new question. Second supplementary, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Carrying on on page two, the Honorable Minister says the Bermuda Police Service was used to transport inmates to and from court and to medical visits. Then goes on to say the impasse reached fever pitch. What caused the fever pitch, in the Minister's words, to take place? Minister. M Mr. Speaker, dealing with a, the Prison Officers Association, things became, uh, both sides became very concerned because they, they were at a deadlock. They could not come to an agreement. And then cooler heads prevailed. They were indeed able to get around the table with the help of the labor relations manager. And they're able, each side, putting together their viewpoint and, and, and indeed a roadmap to go forward. I highlighted in the statement what the, what the key points were going forward. And they ne negotiated some key moving points going forward. Mr. Speaker, the issue is centered around the security it's centered around the physical plans, and it's centered around the health and safety, specifically the mold. The mold was a growing and a significant concern with the prison officers. They believe, and rightfully so, that their health is being affected by the mold in the facilities. We, number one, and I will repeat this from the statement, we have looked at a mold remediation plan. We have an air quality survey that will take place in the not-too-distant future. Directly thereafter, Mr. Speaker, we will have the first element of it where we will have a professional team to come in and clean the prisons. The health and safety of the prison, um, the corrections officers, are paramount, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, your third question? Uh, third question, Mr. Speaker. Yes. In the bottom of page two, the Honorable Minister says the Westgate Correctional Facility had limited hot water supply. When did this start and what areas was it limited to? Mr. Speaker, hot water is hot water, isn't it? When you have a facility that is governed by two hot water heaters, the hot water heaters at the Westgate Cor uh, uh, Correctional Facility was not working. This was something that was not budgeted for. It had to go through um, the procurement process. After going through the procurement process, it had to go through cabinet. It then had to be ordered. It then has to be shipped to Bermuda. Then it has to be installed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For a supplementary? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, I know the answers, but it wasn't, didn't say when it started and what areas, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Yes. At question. any time, Mr. Speaker, was the facility without hot water? Minister? Mr. Speaker, I apologize. Mr. Speaker, can I have the question repeated, please, Mr. Speaker? Um, Thank you. Yes, Mr. Hot. Speaker, most certainly. At any time, was the Westgate Correctional Facility without hot water? I would have to confirm that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Would you like to put a second supplementary? Okay. Um, supplementary? supplementary yeah. Yes. C considering the, uh, the, the minister's uh, brought up uh, having to go out to procurement and the likes, does he have an idea of the, uh, the cost for some of this remediation work that they've done? For the hot water heater? No, well, you mentioned that uh, it had to go out to procurement. I'm asking, uh, with, the, with all of the remediation that he's spoken to here, does he have an idea of, and it wasn't in the budget, does he have an idea of the cost? I, I didn't say that there was remediation that wasn't in the budget, Mr. Speaker. I spoke to something specific. I was asked specifically about the mold, 
excuse me, I was asked specifically about the hot water heater. When asked about the mode, I said that indeed a plan would be put in place and we will commence um, the remedi some of the remediation, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to clear up something really quickly. With reference to, I was asked specifically by uh, um, MP Dunkley about um, the hiring of a new Commission of Corrections. I just want to make the record clear, Mr. Speaker, the hiring of any civil servant does not fall within any minister, the ambit of any minister. That is indeed 100% the remit of the Public Service Commission. Um, just point of correction, yeah. clarification. Yeah. I did not ask about the hiring of a new commissioner. I asked if the seconded commissioner was coming back to the facility. And, and, and that is indeed a matter for the PSC and not the minister, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the clarification on the question and the response. Um, well, if you can get one of the other members to ask as you used up all your questions. I, I allowed you to cl clarify. Uh, you do have one supplementary, yes. You, yes, left, you yes, do. Mr. Speaker, I, have, I say that it's, yes. like, it's like the last phone call you get to make, you know, the supplementary. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, your the, second supp your supplementary, last supplementary, your final supplementary, one, yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker, the Prison Act um, defines certain responsibilities the minister can take. And um, I would suggest that under the act, the, the minister does have responsibility for, for some running of the prison. So uh, how long does the honorable minister think it will take to um, have the acting commissioner confirmed or to have a commissioner of corrections put in place? Um, minister? That is a matter for the Public Service Commission and not the minister. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, did you have a supplementary to your? No. I okay. Misunderstood my question. I want to clarify the question. Yeah. Can I clarify, clarify the question? Yeah. What I said was, since he mentioned that uh, he had to go to procurement involving the mold and the likes, and he also mentioned, I said, and mentioning in his uh, um, statement other work that had been done, I was trying to find out did he have an idea of the total cost? He's mentioned all these other things that they've done. Uh, did he have an idea of the cost of all of these works that were being done? Upgrading, he mentions, um, of a power system, uh, the telephone system, the alarm system, uh, infrastructure system. He goes on about those, some of those things that were addressed. Thank you. Minister? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to aggregate the cost of each one of those things. Yes, they, they would have to, I would aggregate the cost, and at the earliest opportunity, they'll come back with an aggregated cost of, of the things that were mentioned um, and, and present that to this honorable house. Thank you. Um, moving on, Minister, you also have questions from the Honourable Opposition Whip. Would you like to steal? Okay. And the Honourable Member sitting next to you, would you like to put yours? Honourable Member Atherton. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, to you, to the Minister. On page three, or the third page, even though it's not numbered, um, there's an indication that 25 new correction officers were hired in September 2018, um, um, and the recruiting process for 22 correction officers commenced in March 2019. Could the minister indicate to us what has been the attrition level in the past couple of years? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I cannot speak to the attrition levels, but what I can tell this honorable house that at currently there are 186 customs, excuse me, corrections officers. 186 corrections officers. Let's, keep, let's, let's, do some, let's do some numbers here. We have, as of this morning, 166 people incarcerated in Bermuda totally. 129 of those at Westgate. 11 of those are at 11 of those are at the co-ed facility and 26 of those are at the prison farm. And let's look at the other end with prison officers. There are 186 corrections officers. In September of this year, we hired 25 prison officers. We have a vacancy of 32 prison officers. In the next two months, we will have an intake of 22 new officers. I do not have the numbers of people at the attrition, but the attrition, obviously, with people retiring, that is a number that we have to factor in. But the ultimate aim is that we have a very high ratio of prisoners to officers. We have officers that are rightly trained. We have a clear indication that people are still trying to come to the prison service because we have people that are coming every year. There is a training and development program that is in place by the uh, Commission of uh, Corrections, and we plan to continue to train and develop the Bermudians that come in there for service for the, people, for the Department of Corrections, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. 
Supplementary or second question? Sup supplementary. Yes. Um, could the minister indicate to us what has been the retirement ratio? Because obviously on the one side is recruitment, the other side is retirement. If he could indicate to us what has been the retirement ratio over the last couple of years. I think you made some reaction of re Okay, continue. Mr. Speaker, we have to get the re retirement ratio. Um, this is the first I've ever heard of a retirement ratio, Mr. Speaker. If, 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 the, if the question is answered, the learned member could explain what she means by a retirement ratio. I can clarify that, and clarify perhaps it will make please. it very simple. If you say that 20 people are retiring that year and you have 186, well, you're going to end up having a retirement ratio of 12, 12 or 13 percent. And the retirement ratio obviously is relating to the recruitment ratio. So can the minister say how many people have been retiring on a yearly basis in this department over the last few years? I cannot, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I can't. The last three years will be sufficient. Mm -hmm. I, 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 can, I cannot speak to those numbers, Mr. Speaker. There is something that, that's something I can look into. Mr. Speaker, with your leave, Mr. Speaker, um, the Department of Corrections over the last year has spent up, no more than $200,000 on repairs. The prison was completely without hot water for approximately nine months. Supplementary? Supplementary. It was your second supplementary. Second, second supplementary. Um, Mr. Speaker, the, 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 mem the minister indicated um, in terms of he, t he told us how many prisoners were there and he told us how many prison officers were there. But if the minister would indicate that my understanding is that the numbers of prisoners have been going down, so could he relate that the... the the numbers of prisoners that we're having in Westgate to the numbers of prison officers that we have, what the ratio is, bearing in mind, I'm understanding that it's been going down. Minister? Mr. Speaker, um, I seek your, seek your indulgence. I'm actually not clear on the questions, Mr. Speaker. I was not clear on the question, Mr. Speaker. Um, member, could you clarify your question a bit for the sake of the minister so he could respond to it? My question was based on the numbers of prisoners mm -hmm. that we've had over the last, say, three years, the number of prison officers that have been um, in terms of the establishment, I just wanted to understand the ratio because um, if you're having fewer prisoners, then you possibly would need fewer prison officers to manage them. Minister, did you... Mr. Speaker, could you, could you translate the question, please, Mr. Speaker? Um, Minister, I'll suggest that you just clarify that you can answer that in mind, but you'll try and get information for at a later point. Mr. Speaker, I don't know what I'm getting information for. I don't, I don't understand the question fundamentally, and I say that respectfully. I, don't, I, I do not want to promise something, and I don't understand the basis of the question. We've given an indication that we have 166 uh, prisoners that have been incarcerated at present, two mm -hmm. in the island, and that we have 186 prison officers. I don't understand what the question is. She asked about how many officers have retired, um, and, uh, year by year, I said I will, I will get that number. I do not understand the essence of this question, Mr. Speaker. And that um, is basically... Um, member, member for, the, for, the sake, for, for the sake of clarity, I'll allow you to get to your feet again if you want to clarify it one last time. Okay, you allow your colleague to you put a supplementary and clarify it? I'm going to try to clarify it. Over the past three years, what has been the, what were the number of prison officers employed in 2016, 2017, 2018, and what were the number of prisoners in 2016, 27, 2018? So it was a ratio per. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will get those numbers, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, do you have a second question? question. Yes, your second question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Second question. Yes. On the next page, um, there's an indication of a lot of uh, upgrading that was taking place. And it was, there's an indication that the telephone system was recently upgraded. 
Could the minister indicate whether there are any old analog systems still in the department? Mr. Speaker, clearly, you cannot. The, 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 there are two types of systems. There is a fully digital system, and then there, is, there are very few places on the planet that are still using analog systems, Mr. Speaker. I know when people try to sound um, as if they understand telecoms, it is a digital system and it is a regular, uh, 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 a non-digitized system. But there are very few people using analog communication. They have a PIN system and they have a regular um, telephone system in the prison, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Nobody sup sup supplementary? <laughs> Just to clarify then, so there are no different systems that need to have seamless communication there? Mr. Speaker, all, all communication systems have to talk to each other. Sometimes with communication systems, the, the officers have duress systems that operate on a frequency, and so that will be a telecommunication system. The officers use radios. That's a form of telecommunication systems. has the ability to use a frequency. The, there are pin phones in the system that are used by the prisoners. That is a specific system. There are telephones in, that are used by the officers. That, that's a specific system. Those systems don't necessarily have to communicate with each other. They all have to be operable at the same time, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Any further? No further questions? Okay. Minister, that brings the close to the questions for you. We have one further statement that has questions, and that's for the Minister of Transport. Minister, you have a question from the... You had a minister question for... Minister, I, 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 yes, I did overlook you. I had you down for transport, too. But you are still doing your transfer one, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Minister Kays, the deputy, deputy opposition leader, has a, has a question for you as well. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as you're aware, my son is incarcerated, and um, a couple of months ago, one of the inmates attacked his roommate and bit his ears off, wrapped him around his neck in a necklace, and went to Chow Hall. And I'm telling you this story because I'm concerned on page two about the corrections officers having to deal with mentally ill patients. And I know that there is going to be a mental health forensic unit established, but what's being put in place in the interim to protect the prison officers and to assist them in dealing with the mental health patients that, that sorry, mental health prisoners that are currently there. So there is going to be a mental health response unit, but what is in place in the interim to help the prisoners to deal with mentally ill patients? Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, therein lies some of the challenges. The teams, the, a, number, a number of, of the prison officers have challenges in dealing with them. And, and, Mr. Speaker, and I, and, I, and I will not go too far off. That is a challenge that we are having in our country, dealing with mentally, health, mentally ill people all through the island. The prison is no different than that they're having in the courts, that they're having with the Department of Social Services. We have, as a society, we have people that are incarcerated with mental health uh, uh, challenges. We do not have the right training, and we do not have the, the amount of people that we need to help in these facilities. The team is desperately putting together a plan to man manage them. When it is needed, they get the, the, the help from the Maui team. The Maui team are overworked based on the challenges that they have, and it's about finding balance. What we've realized is that we need a forensic mental health unit in Bermuda, and that there is an effort to put all the teams to get together, to put together a plan. In the interim, they, are, they have a team at the Westgate, Westgate Correctional Facility that are dealing with it. When inmates are significantly in need of mental health treatment, they are sent to um, the Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute for treatment. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I just had some answers to um, a few of the questions. If I seek your leave, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's still other questions that need to be put in relation to other matters. Um, supplementary on this? Yes. Um, the, the minister made reference to um, the plan that was being put together. If the minister would reflect that there was a plan that was, that was put with respect to having those persons that n needed mental health um, being assessed and going off the island, I just wondered if he could indicate where that plan is because that would obviously eliminate, alleviate some of the issues at uh, Westgate. Minister? That plan is a plan in progress. We have one particular person that has been sent overseas for treatment. We do full assessments, uh, and based upon the need, if the need is, 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 is the requisite need is there, we do send people abroad uh, for, for treatment overseas. Thank you. Supplementary? Supplementary? 
There you've got nine seconds, seven right, seconds. Supplementary. Um, nine seconds to... Nine to, seconds, two seconds left oh. now. That's it. That brings us to a close of the question period for today. And we now move on. Um, we now move on, and it's... Congratulatory and no obituary speeches. Would any member like to speak to this matter? I recognize that the Honorable Member Brown was on his feet. Honorable Member? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Um, I'd like to ask the Honorable House to send condolences to three, the families of three individuals. The first is Ms. Um, Alsace Trott from Somerset. Yes. You, you will know Mr. Speaker. Yes. She lived a full life. And she's sadly missed by her children, including Cookie Brown and Stephen and Dennis Brown and Joan Brown. So I'd like to ask the house to send to Judy. To Judy. And include the entire house on this. Secondly, I also sad to announce the passing of her daughter, yeah. Ms. Dapper Brown, mm -hmm. who served for over thirty years in the Bermuda Police Service. Mm -hmm. And she's also sadly missed. And finally, Mr. Speaker, Ms. Um, Jean Holder my aunt as well, mm -hmm. who passed away a few weeks ago. So I asked the Honorable House to send condolences to her as well. And then finally, Mr. Speaker, Ms. Um, Loretta Morton, who passed away last week, the um, associate, Mr. Neville Carroll, and Jean Atherton. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Morton lived a full life. She is the, the mother of my brother-in-law, mm -hmm. Randolph Morton, Randolph um, Shields. And I'd just like to ask this house to send condolences to the family as well, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other members? I recognize the Honorable Member, Minister De Silva. Minister? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like the house to send um, congratulations to a young man, Mr. Zico Johnston. Um, he's a mechanical engineer trainee at Public Works. I'm sure that um, the Minister, Minister Colonel Brux, would like to be associated. Um, this young man, Mr. Uh, speaker graduated um, last year with a distinction, uh, cum laude. Uh, he also introduced robotic engineering to middle school students. And um, he is the son of proud mother and father, uh, Ernest Johnson and Yolanda Johnson, who both happen to work for um, the uh, Department of Transportation. So I'm very happy to um, uh, have the House send congratulations to not only him, but to the family. Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I'd also like the House to send congratulations to Mary Louise Darrell, who lives in Sunnyside Park and turned 104 years old last week. And uh, she is the mother of Glenda Todd, whom I think you know, Mr. Speaker. Yes. And um, being the family that they are, I remember when she turned 100, and they preferred not to have any fanfare whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And they would like that tradition to continue. But I did get permission from the family to... Uh, at least acknowledge and associate it, uh, Mr. Um, Kim Swan, with this. Um, and um, it must be the water up in Southampton, Mr. Speaker, because you will know that um, uh, former member uh, Mr. Reggie Burr's mother lives to she is 104 as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd, it's nice to see that that Southampton tradition continues. Thank you. We recognize the leader of the opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I uh, have the opportunity to uh, celebrate and uh, with the premier and um, with uh, the governor to celebrate Christ Church uh, of God, uh, Christ Church, uh, Church of Scotland in Bermuda, the 300th anniversary in Bermuda. Uh, and so we had a, a wonderful service that we were um, um, treated to. What I would like to say to uh, about this particular church um, and its 300th anniversary um, was that there was a gentleman um, who came to Bermuda um, back in the uh, 30s uh, at a time when the churches, quite frankly, amongst the island were pretty much segregated. Um, and uh, he uh, had gone to a particular church and um, um, he, he got there and, and because of the segregation he was told, uh, coming from the island, sister island, uh, he was of color, uh, uh, he was told where to sit um, and uh, after they told him where he could sit in the church, 
They uh, then proceeded to take up an offering, and of course he had brought his offering and gave it, uh, but the church decided to take up a second offering, uh, which pretty much vexed him at that time because he had only prepared for one offering. Um, and uh, so he wound up at um, the Church of Scotland up in Warwick uh, that we are celebrating the 300th anniversary. And um, that uh, honorable, oh, well, he was uh, he's passed now, the honorable member, uh, then came, became the first black premier of Bermuda, Mr. Um, uh, Everett E.T., Richards. Um, and so we had the delight, and he wound up uh, serving at this church. And the reason he served at this church was because he went there, uh, and it wasn't segregated. Back then, it wasn't segregated. And so we celebrate the fact that there were many, even back then, who were tr attempting to be progressive at a time where segregation was at its height in Bermuda. And so I congratulate the church on its 300th anniversary uh, and its uh, willingness to integrate even back then. I'd also like to congratulate the um, Bermuda Outstanding, Outstanding Teens Awards. Uh, and I must uh, say that um, uh, there were several uh, honorable members there, um, uh, Minister of Education, the um, Premier, uh, the Governor, and the likes. We had the opportunity. Yes, Minister Weeks was there as well, um, um, and uh, our Shadow Minister of Education um, was there as well, Cole. Uh, Simons, and um, my goodness, Bermuda is in good hands. We have uh, some very talented young people within the island, uh, and I believe that the Premier was able to get up and when he gave his speech to reiterate uh, the fact that uh, we're looking good, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, I also would like to congratulate, um, I was, uh, had the opportunity up at Southampton Princess, and it was so many people, I, I can't recall who else was there. I know Cole Simons, the honorable member, was there. I can't remember any other MPs. But I wanted to gra congratulate Deepak uh, for coming to Bermuda and telling us we should walk around barefooted. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'll speak very quickly. Mr. Speaker, could the um, House send its um, condolences to the family of Leroy Simmons, well-known musician that passed away? And could you associate the entire House uh, with that a well-known well musician who was a constituent of mine and also a teacher in the public school system. Uh, again, I want to um, join in with the former premier to, uh, congratulating the Outstanding Teen Awards. Once again, another successful event. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to send congratulations to the organizers of Spring Into the Arts, which is done by the Department of Education. Um, Dr. Dorm Thompson, um, the Education Officer for Arts and Leadership. Uh, this is a competition, this is a performance that's been going on since 1995, and this week, was last night was held, uh, it was the Del Ward the middle school portion of it that was held at Ruth Seton James. I would also like to have a special mention made to the students of Del Ward middle school and of West Pembroke primary school who did a uh, tribute to the 60th anniversary of the theater boycott. It's something that I did ask the department to put out to the schools and I was very happy to see that uh, two of the schools took their mantle up and did a performance um, dedicated to that. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to send congratulations to the staff and students of Francis Patton Primary School, and I would associate um, um, MP Wayne Furbert with that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we were treated to a very special performance. Um, by way of explanation, um, Francis Patton is a school that has a Lighthouse School certification which is a certification that is obtained through Franklin Covey's Seven Habits Education Arm. Mr. Speaker, Francis Patton is the only school in the Caribbean to have achieved this certification. It's a certification that requires a minimum of four years prior to being even considered. So it is a, it's, a phenomenal, um, it's a phenomenal accomplishment that the school has done. I also want to send congratulations to the former principal who started the initiative, uh, Ms. Gar Ms. Garita Coddington, and... Um, and and a shout out to the rest of the, um, the, principal, the principal that's there now who continued on with that and put it in place. The one thing that I do want to make a special notice of is the students gave performances on the day. And I want to talk about a P2 class that did a performance dedicated to standard-based education. They did a performance that showcased what standard-based education is and showcased why it is important for us to move towards that and how its implementation will improve our education system for the better. So I find it very interesting that a P2 class can articulate 
and put out there exactly what standard-based education is, while some persons within these chambers cannot seem to understand what's going on there, Mr. Speaker. But I will endeavor to get that. They filmed, the, or they filmed it. I will endeavor to Thank get a copy of that film and pass it on to I members further. The Honorable, uh, Minister Richard, uh, Minister Richard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to offer condolences to the family of June Audrey Gwendolyn Swan, more fondly known as Granny Swan by my family. She's actually the mother-in-law of my sister, Sherry Swan, and the mother of her husband, Brian Swan. I'll associate the whole, whole house with the passing of Granny Swan. Granny Swan lived a full life. She enjoyed traveling. She cruised to all sorts of different places around the world. And she always had an enthusiasm, a very youthful enthusiasm for life, even though she passed at 92 years old. She was uh, the backbone of the Swan family. She survived by her son, Jerry Swan, who many in this house will be familiar with from his sporting activities, Ms. Velma, Mrs. Velma Anderson, Gavin Swan and my brother-in-law, Brian Swan. Granny Swan also had a very close relationship with my nephew, Sean Swan. And it was, it was always amazing to me to, to watch him, he's young, and her, obviously an elder, interact, dance, laugh, and I know he's gonna miss her, her passing. So I just wanna ex extend condolences. I would also like to extend condolences to the family of another young, beautiful lady who passed, Giovanna Watson. Ms. Watson was uh, very well known in the salsa community here. She loved to dance to Latin music. And she, she's also the author of a book de detailing her battle with cancer. The book was, it's entitled, Let Me Introduce Myself. And, he, and uh, she was also rewarded the Global Relay for Life Hero of Hope Award last year. Um, Ms. Watson carried herself in a very dignified manner, dealing with a very difficult disease. And many people in Bermuda are feeling her loss. And she will always be remembered. She had a very vibrant, very sparkling personality. And once again, I would like to extend Condolences to the family of Ms. Giovanna Watson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Recognize General uh, Member Commission. Honorable Member. Commission, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is uh, great to be back in your chamber. Mr. Speaker, they say that the good that men do is often interred with them upon burial in their graves, their bones. Well, certainly that does not apply to Mr. Lloyd James. And it was fitting that we took a minute of silence to honor him for his work as a former parliamentarian, as a sitting member of parliament for Warwick East. I remember as a young man when, or a young teenager, when he and Mr. Brangman took those coveted seats in Warwick East. It did provide some sense of optimism for us in the PLP, even the young persons like myself, that a better day was coming. Mr. Speaker, Mr. James represented that area of Warwick East and the people of Bermuda very well. He was a man of integrity, a gentleman giant if there was ever one, and he is sorely missed. Of course, I can't sit down without also acknowledging the role he played as a leading cricketer in this country. At an even younger age, I guess by the time I was two, three, well, no, three, four, or five years old, and the family would take me to cup match, I always marveled at him when he came out. And you know the damage he did on successive cup, match, cup matches to the Somerset team. You were on a good wicket, you know. Uh, you were on a good wicket. <laughs> but uh, again, I mean, that man, imagine when we were like four or five or six years old and to look up at that man. Yes. And, and then to witness the, the damage he would do with that bat. 
I, I actually loved Mr. James, and I, again, I knew him personally. We won't forget those eras. And uh, sure. we won't forget that era, and we won't forget Mr. James. He has cemented his, his reputation as a true legend on so many domains of Bermuda. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, before I go, or before I sit down, I just want to also acknowledge a constituent, Ms. Sybil Parentchief. Ms. Parentchief, who spent her final days at the Elizabeth Hill Senior Residences up on Happy Valley Road, just off of there, uh, was born in Jamaica, but has been, lived here for a number of decades, and she passed away only recently. Uh, people may remember her son, Paul Pierce, who graced our football fields, uh, I guess, back in the maybe late 80s, early 90s. Uh, he just predeceased her. And again, I just want to offer my condolences to her family. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now recognize the Honorable Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to be associated with the remarks concerning regarding Lloyd James, who will be fondly remembered by the Somerset fans <laughs> who, who threshed their builders uh, to all parts of the field with some of the biggest cities in the world. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, you know Mr. James was also his, his leaves to mourn his wife, Betty, and uh, his brother, a former minister, Alvin James. Mr. Speaker, I would like for this house to send condolences to Rowena Smith Raleigh from Harris's Bay, um, who died and passed. Mr. Speaker, um, that's the mother of Cordell Raleigh, mm. and um, his mother. I would like to associate the Pearl House with, yes. with these remarks. A wonderful lady from Harris's Bay. And uh, she, she had uh, five children, Fred, um, Delvin, Robin, and Leanne. Also, Mr. Speaker, I'd like this house to send condolences to the family of Ms. Ms. Dorothy Horton, the mother of uh, Bobby Horton, uh, former Speaker Randy Horton, Alan K. Horton, and June Dill. Mr. Speaker, uh, the whole house. I associate the whole house with that, those, um, those condolences. Also, to Ms. Miss uh, Pinky uh, Phillips Dixon, a cousin of mine, mother of Gary Phillips, um, like for this house to send, associate the house with yeah. the condolences to send to her, and Mr. Lloyd Walker, um, Sonny Walker, better known from, from Bailey's Bay, Hamilton Parish, lived in St. George's. Um, he leaves to mourn his wife and some children, one of his children, Damon, who works for planning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Now I recognize the Deputy Opposition Leader, Honorable Member, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to offer congratulations to all of our young athletes who participated in the Carifta Games and um, represented Bermuda very well, and they brought substantial medals home. So I'd like to congratulate all those athletes. And I would also like to congratulate the members of the Bermuda Pilot Gig Club who represented Bermuda over in the Silly Isles in the UK. The women, uh, I don't have all of the statistics, but the women came 80th place out of a um, group of over 160 boats, and the men came 88th out of, a, uh, I think, 163 boats. And in particular, I'd like to congratulate the members of my club, um, Laura Lyons and Neva San Felice, who also represented Bermuda over in the Silly Isles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. I recognize the Premier. I'm a Premier. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, just before I begin uh, with my remarks, I'd just like to uh, be associated with the uh, condolences uh, to the family of Ms. Uh, Giovanni Watson, uh, the former member, of course, um, Mr. Lloyd James, um, the, uh, for the uh, mother of the former speaker, uh, Ms. Dorothea Madeline Peggy Horton, and also to be associated with the uh, remarks that were given to uh, Brother Leroy Simmons. Mr. Speaker, I also would like to um, send my condolences to the family and friends of a constituent of mine, uh, Ms. Janet Stewart, who passed away last month. Uh, Ms. Stewart leaves to mourn her husband, uh, Toby Stewart, and her daughter, Tanya Stewart. She was in her 81st year of West Park Lane. Um, and I fondly remember when I first uh, started uh, canvassing in Pembroke, West Central, um, the she always had a sharp wit, but she would always make sure that she would willingly give vegetables from her garden, which she tended to 
all the time. The second thing, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, send heartfelt sympathies, and I'll associate the whole House uh, with this, to the family and friends of Ms. Rashina Beek, um, who sadly passed away uh, last month. I said it was a speaker last uh, Ms. Beek was well known for her cultural bookstore, Nubian Nook, and gladly assisted members of the Progressive Layer Party with African garments for the PLP's Wakanda Banquet uh, last year. Um, her big and infectious smile will surely be missed, and we pray that her parents um, and her three children uh, will find uh, comfort uh, during uh, this difficult uh, time. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to extend uh, condolences to the untimely passing of Mr. Hugh uh, Antoine Hugh Plex Seaman, uh, son of Rudolph Seaman and Angela Seaman, who was in his 22nd year of Granaway uh, Drive. And I'll certainly associate the whole house uh, with this, Mr. Speaker. Um, it was without question um, an unfortunate accident. Um, I, and it, I know that the thoughts of the entire house uh, with his family uh, during that loss. Uh, the young man, uh, actually, the day, uh, that day was um, on the carpet at National Stadium, and it's uh, very sad uh, what happened uh, during that instance. The final thing, Mr. Speaker, I'd certainly like to be associated with the congratulations uh, to the Outstanding Teen Awards, and I just want to spend a special note of congratulations to the overall winner and Outstanding Teen, uh, Ms. Madison Quick. She is, without question, an exceptional young Bermudian, and we're looking forward for excellent things you from her the number. in the future. You've followed the number. And a youth follow-up member as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member, Mr. Simons here, who jumped up pretty quickly that time. Honorable member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to associate myself with the comments made in regards to the Crifta Games and Mrs. Horton, Dorothy Horton. I'd like to also associate myself with the comments made in regards to the Church of Scotland and the 300th anniversary. I actually went to school, Sunday school at the Church of Scotland. Mm -hmm. I met many, many long friends um, uh, at that school. And in fact, I think that the church was a fertile ground for politicians. And I did a quick list, list of the politicians that went there. E.T. Richards, his son Bob Richards, John Patton, Quinton Ednis, and myself, and others. Mm -hmm. So it was a very political church. Um, I'd like to also associate myself with the comments in regards to Lloyd James. He was a neighborhood mentor to boys of my age at the time. He, at the time, was a teacher. Uh, he was a giant of a man, a gentleman. He also took us youngsters fishing and taught us about life and cricket. Mm -hmm. And it was because of him that I became a member of the St. George's Cricket Club. Because mm, mm, he mm, was our mm. mentor, and he played uh, on behalf of all of the uh, uh, Wow. Um, I'd like to also say um, congratulatory remarks to Union Square Productions and the Child Development Program. They hosted the Early Childhood Symposium back in March, Mr. Speaker. The theme was laying a foundation and teaching the whole child. They had over 100 people there and was probably the most informative seminar I've ever had on the development of young people. It was timely because I have a young grandson who's only 10 months old. And it gave me lessons on how to raise a young boy and how to get the best out of them from an academic and a developmental point of view. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people to attend the next workshop that they have because it's, it's educational and it would help with the development of our young people. I think that's all I have, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I recognize the Honorable Member Ms. Furbick. Honorable Member Furbick, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to send uh, condolences to the family of uh, Matriarch of Hamilton Parish, Hillary Richardson. I'd like to associate uh, Hamilton Parish MPs, anyone, anyone else who knew Aunt Hillary who's the aunt of uh, Laverne Richardson and Marva Bridgewater. Uh, the whole, she didn't have any children of her own, um, mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, but she was a mother to many in, in the area of Hamilton Parish. And um, I just want to share a funny little story in regards to Aunt Hillary. She got her driver's license at the age of 65. Mm. And so... <laughs> Uh, also, Aunt Hillary is also the wife of the late uh, Sergeant of Arms, 
Sergeant at Arms, uh, Mr. William Richardson. Um, so she got her license at the age of 65, and Aunt Hillary drove really slow. So if she would offer the neighborhood children a drive in her car, they would tell her no <laughs> because she drove really slow. But I'd like to send condolences uh, out to, to her family. Also, condolences out to the family of Miss Beverly Holder, uh, a constituent of mine. Uh, she leaves behind uh, her daughter, Christy Taylor. Beverly Holder was known. I like to uh, associate that with uh, Mr. Um, your cousin. Okay. Yes, she she's known known truck driver. Yes. And um, they actually had a really nice uh, procession mm. where they drove her, um, her coffin out to Southside. And so it was a really, really good uh, sentiment to uh, Ms. Beverly Holder. I also like to uh, send condolences out to Mr. Javon Henrys. Uh, Mr. Javon Henrys, a young gentleman who uh, was an amputee who um, experienced many things throughout his life, but wanted to send condolences out to, to his family as well. And also congratulations to all the teachers of Bermuda, because this week is actually Teachers Appreciation Week. So if you see a teacher today, thank a teacher. And also wanting to send congratulations out to our youth parliamentarians who wrapped up their um, sessions uh, this year. I associate the whole house with them. They did a spectacular job mm -hmm. uh, rep representing issues uh, and concerns of our island. And I want to send a congratulations out to all of them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. And now I recognize the Honorable Member from Constituency 36. Honorable Member, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's only because you're at constituency 35 that you recognized me as neighbors. So. <laughs> grateful, grateful for that. So, Mr. Speaker, the well, it, was a warm... choice, it was a choice between you and St. George's member. Oh, there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, um, I want to be associated with all the warm associations of condolences for the many noble uh, citizens who have been uh, transitioning. Um, and they've been done in the House. So, uh, but I particularly wanted to be uh, personally associated with the condolence association to uh, the mother of the uh, eminent member so of the Horton family, uh, Mrs. and uh, the Minister of Health, the uh, Honourable Member, Mrs. Uh, Kim Wilson, uh, which is to be associated, and I'm happy to be uh, associating her with the uh, condolences to the family of Dorothea. Uh, Madeline Horton. Uh, I want to be associated with the uh, condolences too. Uh, and I attended the service, the homegoing for Leroy Arthur Simmons. It was a fine service for a, a sad loss and a fine gentleman of our community. Uh, finally, Mr. Speaker, could I ask the House to send condolences to the uh, family of Mrs. Uh, Dorothy Marie Bean of uh, Warwick, the mother of uh, Mrs. Carol Stoneham, uh, the grandmother of Mr. Marshall Barrett Blair Stoneham, again, the Minister of Health, my colleague, uh, wishes to be associated, Mrs. Uh, Minister Kim Wilson, and certainly a member of the Warwick, uh, Warwick uh, clan and family, the Honorable Member, Mr. Cole Simons, wishes to be associated. I was, I, I was saying, in saying that uh, Mrs. Bean, the widow of Mr. Norris Bean, a great uh, uh, family uh, in the Warwick Parish, uh, Mrs. Bean is the grandmother, as I said, of uh, Marshall Barrett Blair Sonam and Lady Justice uh, Nicole Sonam, who's, uh, uh, and her homegoing service was one that was uh, a lovely occasion to be present to say farewell to this dear lady. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. And now I recognize the Honorable Member, the, the opposition whip. And remember, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to get up and uh, send condolences to the family of Claire Ann Moore. She was a resident at Summerhaven, yes. and um, and was one of the one of the first members uh, to residents to live at Summerhaven. Uh, I want to associate my colleague Leah Scott, and uh, I'm going to associate the entire house, um, because there are many hands risen today. Mm -hmm. um, Claire Ann Moore was uh, one of the first residents at Summerhaven. She was also one of the more outspoken uh, residents, especially during a time of challenge at Summerhaven. 
Uh, and she is, I believe, the catalyst in bringing about a much better quality of life at Summer Haven. Uh, and she certainly remained a representative of Summer Haven, um, especially during our uh, family and friends social uh, events and such. So she was an active member of the community at Summer Haven. She will be missed. And uh, I would just like very much to send out the condolences to her family and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now recognize the Honorable Member, Ms. Fogo. Ms. Fogo, you have the floor. You, 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 you. That was a difficult choice. There was another Thompson member who raised. You almost lost out that time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to be associated with the comments regarding the congratulations to our Carifta teams, both the athletic team as well as the swim team. Uh, the athletic team did achieve six medals and placed sixth out of 17 nations, and the swim team received 42 medals, as I think everybody understands. In swimming, um, competitors can take place in many events, whereas in athletics, they can only take place in two events each outside of relay. Um, and that was a great get for both teams. And the swim team placed second overall, especially after their last day, which um, brought in a few more medals, allowing them to push up to second place. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I also want to say congratulations to our men's football team for qualifying for CONCACAF Gold Cup. That is a great feat. I'd like to associate uh, member uh, MP Weeks, well, a whole house, a whole house, um, with, with those remarks. Mr. Speaker, again, Bermuda is punching above her weight, and she is showing the rest of the world her abilities. And that, 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 that's great indeed. Mr. Speaker, um, I'm going, I want to also highlight, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't while we were sitting before, our Special Olympians. They did a tremendous job also receive, I'd like to associate um, in particular, okay, the Hill House. They did a spectacular job over there in Dubai. And again, um, it speaks to what we produce here in Bermuda. Some fine, fine, superb individuals. Mr. Speaker, I, <clears throat> sorry, I would like to be associated with the condolences for the James family, the Horton family, the Phillips family, the Beak family, um, and also I would like to um, point out the laws of uh, the Pitcher family in St. David's, um, and condolences to Ms. Carol Pitcher and her family for the loss of her husband. Um, I finally want to say association for the condolences for Leroy Simmons, who was a fellow, um, not classmate, but a graduate, fellow graduate um, of both myself, Walton Brown, and MP Weeks, and so um, we all closely know Leroy, and um, we will miss him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We now recognize the honorable member from Constituency 32, I believe it is. Yes, Mr. Simmons. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and thank you. Mr. Speaker, allow me to express my deepest condolences to Ms. Dorothea, the family of Ms. Dorothea Horton, who is certainly, and so I associate myself, having been already associated uh, to this, with my honorable colleagues, to this honorable lady uh, who served our community uh, in the constituency, and she was one of my constituents. Mr. Speaker, Ms. Hort Mrs. Thornton represented an error in Somerset, an error in the West End that cannot, cannot be overlooked nor forgotten. I believe that she represented a mother uh, of fine children who have devoted uh, a sincere amount of their time to serving the community as she had served and they were well taught and their children have proven that they are willing to serve our community as well. So I believe that it is fitting that we recognize her contribution 
Also, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity on numerous occasions prior to joining this honorable house of sitting down with her and talking much on politics, much on the ways of the party and also the ways of the community. She represented as a woman, uh, a, a stalwart in our community who saw the value of family, who saw the importance of making sure uh, that she served uh, her family, but also served her community. And she will be sorely, like so many uh, in our Western community, she will be sorely missed. So I join our house in giving this honorable lady uh, certainly uh, our tribute and appreciate her and appreciate her family uh, for the work that they have done and the work that they continue to do in our community as they commemorate and serve her, uh, her memory. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. And I now recognize the member from your neighboring constituents, constituency 20, um, 33, Honorable Member Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. Um, I rise today to begin with a tribute to someone who epitomized the often overused cliche term African Queen. Rashina Beek was a intellectual component of Bermuda's Afrocentric movement. She was a spiritual component of that movement. And she represented the cultural movement through dance and art and will be truly missed. But I think one of the things I had the pleasure of knowing Miss Rashina Beek since I was 14 years old. And a little anecdote she probably wouldn't have never shared, she taught me how to dance. Mm -hmm. And the last time I saw her was New Year's Eve. She brought in New Year's Eve at my house with my family and friends. And it speaks to the passing nature of life of how quickly someone should go. And if nothing else I take from her life is to not only be conscious and be aware of who you are and love who you are, but hug and be precious with the people that you have close to you because you never know when they can be taken. Mr. Speaker, I also would like to be associated with the remarks related to the passing of Mr. Leroy Bean, who I knew for many years through broadcasting, but I really, 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 Leroy Simmons, sorry, for, sure. I'm having a slow day, Leroy Simmons. I had known through broadcasting and known through many years, but I first became close to him when we were both highly educated Bermudians who were required to work as night watchmen because we couldn't find full-time employment in our own country. He served the Bermuda Entertainers Union with honor because he lived it. He lived what it was like to struggle as an entertainer in this country. He lived what it was like to be able to try and stretch that dollar to make it go further. And for that, he was a strong and uncompromising advocate for our people, and he will truly be missed. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable late Lloyd James was my father's neighbor in Parliament when they first got elected together in 1980. And I remember my father saying that Lloyd James said to him, I have faced some of the toughest bowlers in the world, but none so tough as the cat calls and attacks that came from the other side. Mm -hmm. But despite that, he overcame that, and during his brief time in this parliament, he spoke for our people, he advocated for our people, and he fought for our people. We owe him a tremendous debt. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to offer congratulations to David and Beryl Furbert and Mr. Chicken, who now have five franchises, mm -hmm. and the House would like to be associated with it, five franchises now in the beautiful parish of Sands, where, and I think that when we look at entrepreneurship as a path for economic empowerment, when we look for role models for people who want to find a way to do for self and employ our people, they are a model. And I think that they should be commended and praised. And finally, Mr. Speaker, on a personal note, and I'm sure not everybody in the House will want to be associated with this one, I'd like to wish my wife, Bermuda's number one talk show host, a happy belated 50th birthday. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Do you now recognize the Honorable um, Member Ms. Atherton? You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like the, the House to send condolences to the family of the late Renee Senegas, who's the husband of Pamela. Um, when, when the uh, member was just talking about people and how quickly they go, I, I, I spoke to Renee very recently, and all of a sudden when you look in the paper and you see it, you think gone too soon. So I'd like to have... Um, condolences sent to his family. I'd also like to um, be associated with the remarks to the family of Lloyd James, but on a different way in the sense that I'm obviously a Somerset supporter, <laughs> and yes, Lloyd, Lloyd had, uh, had lots, of, um, lots of successes, but I got to know Lloyd as a golfer, golfer. because yes. when Lloyd stopped playing cricket, Lloyd started to play golf. And we started to go on a couple trips together with, with you know, the, the men go and, and the women come along. And, 
And I realized that we got to we, we got to talk about about things that are happening and you suddenly realize that sometimes you have more in common than you think and it's good to discuss things that, that you have differences on. Yes. I'd like to be associated with the remarks uh, to the family of Loretta Morton because mm -hmm. I l met Loretta uh, a long time ago when I knew her husband Charles, but her daughter lives right next, lived right next to me, so I would see her coming up and she was looking after her granddaughter. And I think we forget that there's always what I call the circles, the, the 60 degree se separation, that if we look at people and we talk to them, we realize that we interact with lots of people in Bermuda. So if, if I can be associated with those remarks. And last but not least, the three remarks with respect to Clara and Moore. Um, I, as Minister of Health, I had opportunity to be down at Summer's, Summer Haven, Haven, but also I knew Clara Ann when I was actually down at the Director of Finance at the hospital. So, um, you know, she, she, had a, she was one of those persons who battled on and was not going to give up. And so um, I'm really sad to hear of her passing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And recognize Honorable Member Mr. Tyrrell. Honorable Member Mr. Tyrrell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon, all. Mr. Speaker, um, congratulations have already been uh, said to uh, the CARIFTA team in general, but I would cer certainly like to uh, ask for congratulations to be sent to a particular athlete, Nathan Armstrong, who, whilst he was at CARIFTA, uh, was on the podium uh, twice in his um, favorite events. Uh, he got a silver and a bronze. But he has followed it up this week uh, because he's at school in, in, in New Jersey, and he has certainly um, acquitted himself uh, in the P Pasek County Track Championship by placing in two seconds in his, uh, his favorite um, events, which is the 1,600 and the 3,200 um, meters. 1,600 and 3,200. No, the 15 in Carifta. In New US. Jersey, it was 60. U.S. Okay. U.S. calculation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. <laughs> um, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> uh, I'd also like to um, say that when we last recessed, I had the opportunity to attend the uh, Kappa Classic. Um, let me say that I'm particularly mentioning it because the Kappas have actually uh, took over an event uh, that was, I think, run by the Heritage um, Association, which was the Pee Wee uh, Soccer Tournament for Young Kids, and Kappa have taken it over. Um, and, but, and sorry, I understand. Uh, uh, Kappa, the Kappa have taken it over over the last 20 years, and um, it is the premier youth soccer tournament uh, in Bermuda. And I certainly uh, would like for them to be congratulated and also the winners of those uh, respective divisions as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now recognize the Honorable Member, Mr. Swan. Honorable Member Swan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like uh, a letter of congratulations sent to um, St. George's Mayor. Sir George Darling III, and uh, wish him very well. I associate the Honorable Member Ms. MP Ming and uh, Minister Fogo with those comments, and anybody else that would like to be associated with that. Uh, his, his MP, MP Scott. And um, Mr. Speaker, I would like to be associated with the many of the condolences that have been um, expressed today, but Mr. Lloyd James was a very close personal friend of mine who I spent uh, a great deal of time. And I just want to say that Bermuda has lost a giant of a man in many, many avenues of uh, Bermuda life. And uh, maybe uh, uh, something uh, will be written to formally attribute to the greatness of this man, um, particularly his influence on um, the youth of Bermuda. Um, and his style of uh, communicating and teaching through his talents. Mr. Chester Wilkinson from Fair Reach, my cousin, uh, had passed away, and he was uh, an ambassador for tourism in his uh, uh, later years, uh, a, great, a great family man, um, uh, associated with me uh, through, the, through our, our common whole connection, which we proudly talked about often, MP Ming would like to be associated with that. And, and also Ms. Claudine Wilson from Stokes Point has passed uh, on. 
and we send uh, condolences to her family as well, Mr. Speaker. And um, I would like to uh, be associated with the condolences uh, expressed to uh, the family of the late June uh, Swan, whose uh, um, uh, daughter, Ms. Velma Swan, I know uh, Velma uh, uh, Anderson, I know very well in, out in Ferry, and her son Jerry taught me at Barclay. Uh, and uh, I know she, uh, MP uh, Sylvan Richards, did a very good job in um, um, out, outlining her many uh, attributes. I would like to be associated with the con uh, congratulations offered to the Carifta uh, and the football team, um, the Special Olympians. As, uh, as well as the swimming team. There has been a great deal of success. Our young people have done us proud, and we need to continue to invest in them uh, so that uh, we can lay the groundwork for future generations, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. I recognize the Honorable Member uh, MP Mean. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker, and listening audience. Yes. First of all, I'd like to be associated with the comments for the Horton family, the Beak family, the Simmons family, the James family, and I'd just like to add my own comment for the uh, family of June Swan. I know that my colleague um, has already done it, but I happen to know Ms. Swan very well. We were part of a breakfast club for years that met every Sunday morning for um, breakfast. Her daughter, Velma Anderson, which she has been for 42 years, is um, married to my uncle, and we um, enjoy the craziness that she brings, and we understand it. We understood where that craziness came from as we got to know her mom. One of her favorite sayings to us was, I'll see you when I look at you. <laughs> and so I'm going to leave that on that one. She always <laughs> laughs us with that. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to extend a heartfelt congratulations to the new mayor for St. George's, Mr. George Sterling. We are encouraged. And we look forward to working with him um, over the next few years. But on that note, Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to say thank you to the outgoing Mayor Quinnell Francis for her four years of service and some of the things that she did and she brought to the table for St. George's. And one of the things that stands out to me at this time was the fact that we um, now enjoy a public participation part of the monthly meetings. So, Mr. Speaker... I look forward to working with the new mayor, Mr. Darling, to um, see what path and what footprint he makes within our town. And um, I think, like I said, um, be encouraged. I'd also like to um, send congratulations to the East End Mini Yacht Club for their annual seniors tea. Also to the family of the master pilot, Jimmy Darrow, on the annual service. And also the St. George's Community Center for their annual kite making event. And a big shout out to the um, organizers of the Walk to Calvary. I think, Mr. Speaker, you might want to, want to speak to that one this time. <coughs> you were down in the East. Yes, um, I was the there. annual Walk to Calvary. And, and I'd also like to close, Mr. Speaker, on um, just a happy birthday greeting to everybody's favorite Nana. Happy 80th birthday. And that would be my Nana, da Dorothy Paniston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other honorable member wish to speak on condolences or congratulations? Mr. Famous, are you up for that? Yes. Okay, Mr. Famous. Again, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to give some condolences to some members from Devonshire, Ms. Jeanette Mornis, Ms. Mrs. Nolat Frey, sorry, Ms. Nolat Frey, Mr. Carlton James, and Ms. Runette Hill. I also like to thank the congratulate the staff of the House of Assembly for the brilliant 